அனைவருக்கும் வணக்கம் ராமானுஜன் நூத்தி இருபத்தி ஐந்து அமைப்பாளர் குழு மற்றும் கணித அறிவியல் கழகம் சார்பாக அனந்தத்தை அறிந்தவன் என்ற கணித மேதை ராமானுஜனின் வாழ்க்கை வரலாற்று நூல் வெளியீட்டு விழாவிற்கு வந்திருக்கும் சான்றோரை வருக வருக என்று அன்போடு வரவேற்கிறோம் தேசிய கணித மையத்தின் தலைவர் பேராசிரியர் எம் எஸ் ரகுநாதன் அவர்களை வரவேற்புரை அழைக்குமாறு வழங்குமாறு அன்புடன் கேட்டுக்கொள்கிறோம் தலைமை விருந்தினர் திரு என் ராம் அவர்களை மேடைக்கு வருமாறு அன்புடன் கேட்டுக்கொள்கிறேன் பேராசிரியர் சி எஸ் சேஷாத்ரி அவர்களை அழைக்கிறேன் பேராசிரியர் எம் எஸ் ரகுநாதன் அவர்களை அழைக்கிறேன் பேராசிரியர் ஆர் பாலசுப்ரமணியன் அவர்களை அழைக்கிறேன் பேராசிரியர் வாஞ்சிநாதன் அவர்களை மேடைக்கு வழமாறு அழைக்கிறேன் திரு சிக்கந்தர் அவர்களை மேடைக்கு வருமாறு அழைக்கிறேன் தேசிய கணித மையத்தின் தலைவர் பேராசிரியர் எம் எஸ் ரகுநாதன் அவர்களை வரவேற்புரை வழங்குமாறு அழைக்கிறேன் திரு ராம் பேராசிரியர் சேஷாத்ரி விழா தலைவர் பேராசிரியர் பாலசுப்ரமணியன் நேஷனல் புக் ட்ரஸ்ட் டைரக்டர் திரு சிக்கந்தர் பேராசிரியர் வாசிநாதன் மற்றும் இங்கு குழுமி இருக்கும் எல்லோரையும் உங்கள் அனைவரையும் இவ்விழாவிற்கு ராமானுஜன் நூற்றி இருபத்தஞ்சு அமைப்பாளர் குழுவின் சார்பில் வரவேற்பதில் நான் பெருமகிழ்ச்சி கொள்கிறேன் கடந்த நாடு கடந்த கடந்த ஆண்டு நாடெங்கிலும் ராமானுஜன் நூற்றி இருபத்தஞ்சாம் ஆண்டு நிறைவை தேசிய கணித ஆண்டாக கொண்டாடியது உங்களுக்கு பலருக்கு தெரிந்திருக்கும் எங்கள் அமைப்பாளர் குழு அந்த ஆண்டில் பல கணித சார்புள்ள நிகழ்ச்சிகளை நடத்தியது இது தவிர்த்து சில நீண்ட தவணை திட்டங்களையும் தீட்டியது அவற்றுள் ஒன்று ராபர்ட் கனிகல் எனும் அமெரிக்கர் ஆங்கிலத்தில் எழுதியுள்ள த மேன் ஹூ நியூ இன்ஃபினிட்டி என்ற ராமானுஜன் வாழ்க்கை வரலாற்று நூலை பல இந்திய மொழிகளில் மொழிபெயர் மொழிபெயர்ப்பது கடும் சோதனைகளை மீறி பெரும் சாதனை படைத்த கணித மேதையின் சரித்திரத்தை பலரும் தம் தம் தாய்மொழியில் படித்தறியும் வாய்ப்பினை உருவாக்குவதே எங்கள் நோக்கம் நாளை டிசம்பர் இருபத்தி ரெண்டாம் தேதி ராமானுஜனின் பிறந்த நாள் என்பது உங்களுக்கு தெரிந்ததே தேசிய கணித நாளாக அது அறிவிக்கப்பட்டுள்ளது அதை முன்னிட்டே இன்று அத்திட்டத்தின் கீழ் வந்த தமிழாக்கத்தின் வெளியீட்டு விழா நடைபெறுகிறது முப்பது ஆண்டுகளுக்கு முன்னரே தமிழில் ஒரு சிறப்பான ராமானுஜனின் வாழ்க்கை வரலாற்றை எழுதி வெளியிட்டார் ரகமி என்ற புனைப்பெயர் கொண்ட தமிழ் எழுத்தாளர் ரங்கசாமி அவர்கள் அந்நூலை மற்ற இந்திய மொழிகளிலும் ஆங்கிலத்திலும் வெளியிட தேசிய உயர்நிலை கணித வாரியம் நேஷனல் போர்ட் ஃபார் ஹையர் மேத்தமேட்டிக்ஸ் ராமானுஜன் நூற்றுண்டு விழாவின் போது முயற்சி செய்தது பல்வேறு காரண காரணங்களால் அந்த முயற்சி நிறைவேறவில்லை இந்த முயற்சி நடந்து கொண்டிருக்கையிலேயே ராபர்ட் கணிகளின் நூல் வெளிவந்தது இது ரகமியின் நூலை விட விரிவானதும் ரகமியின் நூலில் இல்லாத ராமானுஜனின் வாழ்க்கை நிகழ்வுகள் சம்பவங்கள் பலவற்றை உள்ளடக்கியும் இருந்ததால் ரகமியின் நூலை மொழிபெயர்ப்பதை கைவிட்டு விட்டோம் மேலும் கணிகளுக்கு இங்கிலாந்தில் குறிப்பாக கேம்பிரிட்ஜில் இருக்கும் பல நிறுவனங்களை அணுகும் வாய்ப்பு இருந்ததால் வாய்ப்பு இருந்ததால் 
அவரது நூல் ராமானுஜனின் கேம்பிரிட் நாட்களை மிகச் சிறப்பாக வர்ணிக்க வர்ணிக்க வர்ணிக்கிறது இப்போது அவரது நூல் ரகமையின் படைப்பை விட விரிவானதாக இருப்பதால் அதனையே தமிழ் ப தமிழ் உட்பட பல இந்திய மொழிகளில் மொழிபெயர்த்து வெளியிட முடிவு செய்தோம் ராபர்ட் கனிகல் தமது நூலை மொழிபெயர்ப்பதற்காக மொழிபெயர்ப்பதற்கான மொழிபெயர்ப்பதற்காக காப்பிரைட்டுக்காக ஐயாயிரம் டாலர் வாங்கி கொண்டு கொடுத்தார் அது அவர் அதற்காக நாம் அவருக்கு மிகவும் கடமைப்பட்டிருக்கிறோம் தமிழாக்கம் செய்தவர் பேராசிரியர் வாஞ்சிநாதன் இங்கிருக்கிறார் இந்த மொழிபெயர்ப்பு பணியை அவர் மிக்க ஆர்வத்துடன் ஏற்றுக்கொண்டது எங்கள் குழுவிற்கு மிக மிக சந்தோஷம் அவர் கணிதத்துறை வல்லுநர் அதே போதில் தமிழில் தமிழ் மொழியில் பேரார்வமும் ஆற்றலும் கொண்டவர் அவருக்கு எங்கள் குழுவின் சார்பில் நன்றி தெரிவித்துக் கொள்கிறேன் இந்நூலை ராமானுஜன் கணித கழகம் கணித சங்கம் கணித கழகம் ராமானுஜன் மேத்தமெட்டிக்கல் சொசைட்டி சங்கமும் நேஷனல் புக் ட்ரஸ்டும் சேர்ந்து பிரசுரிக்கின்றன ராமானுஜன் கணித கழகத்தின் சார்பாக அதன் முன்னாள் தலைவர் என்ற முறையில் நான் நேஷனல் புக் ட்ரஸ்ட்டுக்கு நன்றி செலுத்த கடமைப்பட்டிருக்கிறேன் நேஷனல் புக் ட்ரஸ்ட் இயக்குனர் திரு சிக்கந்தர் இங்கே இருப்பது எனக்கு மிகுந்த மகிழ்ச்சியை கொடுக்கிறது இந்த வெளிவீட்டு விழாவில் முக்கிய பங்கேற்று உரையாற்றத்தில் நாம் ஒப்புக்கொண்டதில் எனக்கு பெரும் மகிழ்ச்சி இந்து பத்திரிகையின் அறிவியல் குறிப்பாக இந்து பத்திரிகையில் அறிவியல் குறப்பாக குறிப்பாக கணிதம் தொடர்புடைய செய்திகளுக்கு எப்போதும் அதிக முக்கியத்துவம் கொடுத்து வந் கொடுத்து வந்துள்ளார்கள் இக்கொள்கையை இந்து கடைப்பிடிப்பது திரு ராம் அவர்களுக்கு பெரும் பங்கு உண்டு உண்டென்பதில் எனக்கு எல்லளவும் ஐயமில்லை இந்து பத்திரிகை சமீபத்தில் தமிழிலும் வெளிவர ஆரம் ஆரம்பித்திருப்பது அவர் இவ்விழாவில் பங்கேற்பதை மேலும் அர்த்தமுள்ளமாக்குகிறது ராமானுஜின் தாய்மொழி ஆகிய தமிழில் வெளிவரும் இப்புத்தகத்தின் முதல் பிரதியை பெறுவதற்கு ராமானுஜனின் பின் வழிவந்த இந்திய கணித மேதைகளில் முதல் நிலையில் நிற்கும் பேராசிரியர் சேஷாத்ரி ஈடில்லா தகுதியடையவர் என்றால் மிகையாகாது மேலும் அவர் எனக்கு ஆசிரியர் போன்றவர் நெடுநாள் நண்பரும் ஆவார் பேராசிரியர் வாஞ்சிநாதனும் அவரிடம் கணிதம் பயின்றவர் இவற் இவையெல்லாம் ஒன்றாக இன்று அமைந்திருப்பது இவ்விழாவின் தனி சிறப்பாகும் நன்றி வணக்கம் நன்றி கணித அறிவியல் கழகத்தின் இயக்குனர் பேராசிரியர் ஆர் பாலசுப்ரமணியம் அவர்களை இந்து நாளேட்டின் முன்னாள் ஆசிரியர் திரு என் ராம் அவர்களுக்கு பூங்கொத்து வழங்குமாறு அழைக்கிறோம் பேராசிரியர் எம் எஸ் ரகுநாதன் அவர்களை சென்னை கணித கழகத்தின் முன்னாள் இயக்குனர் பேராசிரியர் சி எஸ் சேஷாத்ரி அவர்களுக்கு பூங்கொத்து வழங்குமாறு அழைக்கிறோம் பேராசிரியர் ஆர் பாலசுப்ரமணியம் அவர்களை நேஷனல் புக் ட்ரஸ்டின் இயக்குனர் திரு சிக்கந்தர் அவர்களுக்கு பூங்கொத்து கொடுத்து வழங்குமாறு அழைக்கிறோம் அனந்தத்தை அறிந்தவன் புத்தகம் தமிழ் உருவெடுக்க காரணமான பேராசிரியர் வாஞ்சிநாதன் அவர்களுக்கு பேராசிரியர் ஆர் பாலசுப்ரமணியம் அவர்களை பூங்கொத்து வழங்குமாறு கேட்டுக்கொள்கிறோம் இந்த விழா நடைபெற முக்கிய காரணகர்த்தமாய் விளங்கிய பேராசிரியர் எம் எஸ் ரகுநாதன் அவர்களுக்கு பேராசிரியர் பி வாஞ்சிநாதன் அவர்களை பூங்கொடுத்துக்கு வழங்கி கௌரவிக்குமாறு வணங்குகிறோம் இவ்விழா நடைபெற உறுதுணையாய் விளங்கிய எமது இயக்குனர் பேராசிரியர் ஆர் பாலசுப்ரமணியம் அவர்களை கௌரவிக்குமாறு திரு சிக்கந்தர் அவர்களை கேட்டுக்கொள்கிறோம்
ಬಿಡ್ರಿ ನ್ಯಾಷನಲ್ ಬುಕ್ ಟ್ರಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ತಿರು ಸಿಕಂದ ನ್ಯಾಷನಲ್ ಬುಕ್ ಟ್ರಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾವಿನ ಇಯಕುನರ್ ತಿರು ಸಿಕಂದರ್ ಅವರ್ಗಲೇ ಉರೆಯಾಟ್ರ ಮೇಡಿ ಕಳಕಿರೇನ್ ಮದಿಪ್ಪುರಿಯ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಶೇಷಾದ್ರಿ ಅವರ್ಗಲೇ ಶ್ರೀ ಎನ್ ರಾಮ್ ಅವರ್ಗಲೇ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಬಾಲಸುಬ್ರಹ್ಮಣ್ಯಂ ಅವರ್ಗಲೇ ಮದಿಪ್ಪಿರ್ಕೂ ಮದಿಪ್ಪುರಿಯ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಎಮ್ ಎಸ್ ರಘುನಾಥನ್ ಅವರ್ಗಲೇ ಎನ್ನುಡೆಯ ನಂಬರ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ವಾಂಜಿನಾಥನ್ ಅವರ್ಗಲೇ ಇಂಗು ಇಂಗು ಇರ್ಕಕೂಡಿಯ ಅನೇತ್ ಅನೇತು ಅಧಿ ಅಧಿಕಾರಿಗಲ್ ಮತ್ತಬಡಿ ಆಸಿರಿಗಲ್ ಅವರ್ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಅನೇವರಕ್ಕೂ ಎನ್ನುಡೆಯ ನಂಟಿ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ವೆರಿ ಡಿಫಿ ಡಿಫಿಕಲ್ಟ್ ಟು ಸ್ಪೀಕ್ ಇನ್ ತಮಿಳ್ ಐ ಕೂಡ್ ಸೊ ಐ ಟ್ರೈ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಐ ಐ ಲೆಫ್ಟ್ ಮದುರೈ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಫೈವ್ ಇಯರ್ಸ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ವೆರಿ ಸಾರಿ ಐ ಕೂಡ್ ಇಂಪ್ರೂವ್ ಮೈ ಸ್ಕಿಲ್ಸ್ ಸೊ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ರೀಸನ್ ಐ ವಾಸ್ ಏಜಿಸ್ಟೆಡ್ ಟು ಕಮ್ ಇಯರ್ ಈಸ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಟು ಟಾಕ್ ಇನ್ ತಮಿಳ್ ಸೊ ಐ ಆಮ್ ವೆರಿ ಫೋರ್ಚುನೇಟ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಹಿಯರ್ ಅಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಮೂಮೆಂಟ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಮೈ ಸೆಕೆಂಡ್ ವಿಸಿಟ್ ಟು ದಿಸ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ uh then um, some time back to three months back i was here for another uh, book uh, you know connected to mathematics uh, but i never read mathematics i was <laughs> running away uh, shying away but and i when i was admitted to the mba program i was forced to read mathematics where i picked up uh, uh, the the skill uh, with the god's grace i was very good in now in statistical and uh, tools and all even my phd thesis is one of the this is often referred by my university and other students so how uh, a person who picks up the skill it matters uh, sometime we are shoving uh, saying away with uh, you know even uh, the, the last time also i said the same thing the national book trust of uh, of late it become known for its uh, publication in social science now we are slightly changing it so we are into science uh, my friend bini is here he is though he is an editor who is uh, looking after science series and we have uh, you know uh, so many uh, discussion we were uh, telling we want to change this because uh, it's not like that uh, uh, the national book trust aim is uh, not to provide any books any kind of books the books which are uh, very much good and uh, which are useful for the people uh, and for its knowledge and cost only we we we, we try to uh, uh, you know bring out so in that india where we are making some sort of, although i am from social science we still we want to bring out more and more science books and a lot of series is coming so i don't want to you know bore my speech uh, because uh, uh, yesterday professor balasubramaniam was telling me why oh, you we you should come because otherwise the, it look like it's not now you are not a part of this program uh, when uh, the matter was referred by i i could uh, recollect the first meeting which i had with uh, professor ragunathan which was referred by uh, 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 professor dinesh singh uh, who is the vice chancellor of delhi university i said it sir okay uh, but it really i, I said it okay but it, i never thought it is a mamuk task of uh, translating into this uh, kanegal's uh, robert kanegal's books in so many indian languages uh, but uh, sir, what uh, then he was professor ragunathan was asking time and again uh reassuring himself uh, sikandar panidvingla uh, panidvingla i said sir no doubt uh, let me put all my horse into uh, you know job but i can uh, because uh, in bt of you everybody knows it is in a government organization it is an old institution professor mr ram was uh, our one of our advisory committee member in uh, tamil language uh, when professor bipin chandra was there it known for its all lethargy and other thing but anyhow we could come with a very good collection now i happy to say that, uh, that uh, first uh, apart from bangla uh, we have uh, the odia uh, uh, you know translation is ready for launch and kannada is already there i am carrying a book and it will be put in the display and the gujarati is underway and the marathi is almost ready so in this year we want i can tell you sir this year itself all this language translation would be ready so it would be fitting to the uh, you know 25th celebrating uh, 25th uh, birth anniversary of uh, uh, mr ramanujam and uh, uh, all my life i was wondering about uh, the ramanujam's work but i am i am very fortunate to be part of that uh, bringing out his biography especially in tamil uh, i have taken a book i wow oh, i will read the book maybe in the next once i finish my uh, current book uh, uh, kushwan singh i will read other also 
so I, I, I very much, um, I'm thank you. Uh, uh, I personally want to thank uh, Professor Raghunathan uh, for, uh, for choosing National Book Trust for this wonderful, noble job of uh, giving out this uh, uh, the biography. And I hope you will find uh, interesting and uh, another good news is we are opening a bo small uh, book shop and book promotion center in, uh, in Chennai. Uh, maybe within 10 days we will be able to open it in the College Street Wawusi building. And hope you could find interesting books in um, NBT books would be available uh, without taking much of my time. And special thanks to Professor Balasuranam. And the no words can be suffix when to thank uh, Professor Vanchinathan. I know. <laughs> There was some problem. He was sitting late at in our uh, guest house and working late night. And my Tamil editor uh, is with his, uh, with his help. We are coping up. And uh, hope uh, uh, this everybody will read this book. And uh, once again, I want to thank uh, Professor Balap Subramaniam to for giving, uh, inviting me to be here for this wonderful book launch. Thank you very much. Adathu nool veliyid. Salame Virinner, Trien Ram Avergal Nulai Velida, Adan Mudal Pradi, Perasir, CSA Shadri Avergal Petrukulvar. தலைமை விருந்தினர் திரு என் ராம் அவர்களை அழைக்கிறோம் Robert Canigalodia, Surrender and the Biography, Tamil Tamil with great nuance and sensitivity. I want to express my admiration. And our Rodia Muripe Palar Kuripilla, he has mentioned that. Canigalodia biography. It <coughs> German Lavandrike, Italian Lavandrike, Greek Lavandrike, uh, Korean Lavandrike, Japanese Lavandrike, Ch Chinese Lavandrike, Thai Lavandrike, and I in India Morigalil, first Bengali Lavandrike, Arindu Arindu Kondain, Tamil Lavandrike, Rumba Mukimana or a contribution in Riga. Is obvious, so I commend the. Although it has taken some time, I commend the people behind this, in particular Professor Raghunathan, and the year dedicated to mathematics is really responsible. Uh, we are, many of us were there at the University Centenary Auditorium, and that took place, and 
we really are pleased that they have delivered on the promise made uh, at that time. There have been various uh, opinions, reviews of Canigal's book, most of them positive, but I remember that one Indian historian, writing in fact in our newspaper, was very critical of uh, Canigal's biography, basically finding fault with him for, uh, he thought the biography fell between Hardy and Ramanujam. And, uh, but several mathematicians remonstrated also with me, because we, at the time we were uh, celebrating many of the achievements of uh, the, our, our genius and championed the biography as their own. And I was uh, very impressed with this particular, I was very interested in this particular controversy, not being able to figure out whether he had done justice to the mathematics. And I was told by the best mathematicians India has had that it, he has indeed done that. But as for the biography, I found it uh, fascinating and insightful. Professor Vanchinathan, in his uh, translator's notes, has pointed out that in translating it, obviously not literally, but with great uh, sensitivity and nuance, uh, that's very clear from what, what I was able to see. He points out that there was a, the notion of audience is important here. Canigal was writing largely, our translator uh, remarks, for an American audience, whereas uh, when, you when you offer it in Tamil, uh, a fascinating story in Tamil. Many of the elementary things, basic things, uh, need to be left out. And in some cases, the translator points out, you have to elaborate what needs to be elaborated depending on the notion of audience. And that's, I think, an interesting point that he makes uh, in his translator's note. For example, he says, no need to explain uh, what idli is, which he had to do the American audience, but uh, he also points out that there are certain basic things like caste, religion, so, and so on, where basic explanations are given, but he didn't leave them out because they were the author's views. This, I think, is interesting. He also told me when we are sitting here that he didn't need to explain cricket to an Indian audience. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> because, but uh, they, they follow IPL in, uh, to a great degree, but uh, uh, Hardy's uh, interest in cricket was not uh, not about the shorter form, but uh, he was uh, he was he was talking about uh, the great cricketers of his time, and when he rated somebody's work as being in the Hobbes class, uh, I think uh, or the, uh, somebody pointed out that uh, that was not the top of the tree for him. The Bradman class was uh, was the greatest, and Hardy, as many of us know, even I know was passionate about uh, cricket. And uh, I, I wait to see what, uh, what has been left out about cricket in, this, uh, in, in that section of the biography, which I'll go to first. But uh, Professor Seshadri, if I can steal a line from you, because you, you might have you might have wanted to say it yourself, was telling me that he found the portrait of Hardy, uh, sketched by Canigal, uh, more fascinating. Uh, 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 because uh, perhaps for cultural reasons and so on, it's very beautifully drawn. That is one comment I heard. So there are bound to be many opinions of uh, Canigal's work. We also had the privilege of having uh, Robert Canigal here. Uh, he, he was specially recognized by India's mathematicians uh, during this, uh, when we celebrated the 125th birth anniversary of uh, Srinivasa Ramanujan. And uh, he also gave a lecture which I think was very interesting. What uh, I think this brings us to the question of biographies. I, I'm personally very interested in biographies. Uh, there are many biographies that one can read, whether it's on politics, whether it's on Churchill or Lenin or Roosevelt or Mughals, provided you have had reliable sources. Very hard to write a biography of Ashoka, although Romila Thapar, as a historian, has done great work on that subject. But uh, coming to more recent times, I think uh, this is an art. And it seems that Hardy looked down on this. And in a mathematician's apology, Hardy starts by remarking on what a melancholy 
experience it is for a professional mathematician to write about uh, mathematics. And he clearly considers the work of biography a second-rate uh, thing for a professional mathematician. Uh, not to be taken literally, of course, because here uh, what Hardy has uh, written about Ramanujam, I think, is, is just magnificent. I uh, got hold of a copy of uh, Hardy's 12 lectures at Harvard, uh, Ramanujan, and the 12 lectures, and the beginning of that, uh, I think, has a, is a wonderful exercise uh, in biography or biographical writing, the kind of thing that he himself seemed to look down upon, if you took him literally. And uh, in this, I skipped the mathematics. Uh, a lot of it is that, but I think there's enough there to give us, those interested in biographies, uh, a deep insight into how Hardy looked into such areas, and particularly on the biography of Ramanujam, which Canigal, of course, uh, quotes. There is also an interesting novel on this subject by David Levitt, an Indian clerk. I think many mathematicians were not happy, I, I believe, with, with the way he approached it, but I found it uh, quite fascinating. Uh, you know what kind of writer he is and the kind of uh, message that he tries to derive from it. But allowing for that, uh, I think it brings out, uh, it's another approach to, uh, to the life and work uh, of a great man. Uh, so I think that also has to be read along with it, and I hope at some point uh, somebody would translate that work as well, leaving out nothing. <clears throat> a biographical novel, which... Uh, which, of course, uh, is a little harsh, it appears, to, on Hardy and, and the way their, this relationship uh, progressed, and then suddenly Ramanachum got back and it was cut short. But going back to uh, Hardy's uh, biographical note in the first lecture in, given and published, in, this was published in 1940 by Cambridge and has been reproduced by AMS Chelsea Publishing, and the last work I think came out in 2002. I was interested in several statements made by, several assertions made by Hardy in this, starting out with uh, the problem dealing with the difficulty in judging Ramanujam. And he says they're obvious, uh, half-educated Indian, worked for most of his life in practically complete ignorance of modern European mathematics, died when he was a little over 30, when his mathematical education had in some ways hardly begun, say, asserts Hardy. And uh, although he published abundantly, he notes he left a great deal of unpublished work, very hard to judge that, what part of it was rediscovery, what part of it uh, was something he had actually learned, and how to judge it, what is its value, and so on. And he confesses that the greatest difficulty for him uh, uh, personally, was uh, he say he claims, of course, uh, correctly, man who was very modest usually uh, had no difficulty in making the claim that I, that Ramanujam was in my way my discovery. He did not invent him, but uh, he was the first really competent person who had a chance to see some of the work. And uh, then he, he he says that uh, he remembers with satisfaction that he could recognize at once. What a treasure he had found. And he, he also asserted that he knew more about Ramanujan than, than any authority on that subject, on that particular subject at that time. Uh, saw him and talked with him almost every day for several years and above all, actually collaborated with him. And then came a very famous sentence, Canigal and various others have quoted, that I owe more to him than to anyone else in the, wor in the world, with one exception, there's been a lot of speculation about what this uh, exception is, whether it was, it was Littlewood or somebody else, and David Le Levitt provides his own twist about the, what this exception was. Uh, and then Hardy goes on to say, and my association with him is the one romantic incident in my life. And uh, his difficulty was not that he didn't know enough. He knew too much and felt too much, and therefore he could not, he thought, be impartial in providing an assessment of Ramanujam's work. And uh, he, of course, uh, being an atheist, he had, his own, he had a daily personal battle with God. And uh, one of the things 
he wanted to prove was to get a persuasive proof that God did not exist, that could convince the public, the members of the public, he once wrote. Uh, he was clear that there was nothing mystical or inexplicable about Ramanujam in that sense, and Ramanujam was uh, very rational, he, and that he, he made all the ritual uh, observances, but uh, he was a very rational man, was the uh, view of uh, Hadi. Um, but I was most uh, fascinated not being able to judge one way or the other uh, with this particular assessment by uh, Hardy, a very famous passage, but nevertheless worth uh, reminding you about. The real tragedy about Ramanujam was not his early death. It is, of course, a disaster that any great man should die young, but a mathematician if often comparatively, is, of, is often comparatively old at 30, and his death may be less of a catastrophe than it seems. Pointing out that Abel died at 26, no doubt he would have added a, a great deal more to mathematics had he lived, but he could hardly have become a greater man. And then the conclusion, the tragedy of Ramanujam was not that he died young, but that during his five unfortunate years, his genius was misdirected, sidetracked, and to a certain extent distorted. And uh, in one revisionist sentence, he goes back on one, one sentence that he seemed to regret, that, uh, it, it, that he had written earlier, soon after Ramanujam died, 16 years before uh, this Harvard lectures, uh, say, say, noting that opinions may differ about the importance of Ramanujam's work the kind of standard by which it should be judged, and the influence it's likely to have on the mathematics of the future. And uh, then making some critical observations, he says that one gift it shows which no one can deny, profound and invincible originality. He would have probably been a greater mathematician if he could have been caught and tamed a little in his youth. He would have discovered more that was new and that no doubt of greater importance. On the other hand, he would have been less of a Ramanujan and more of a European professor, and the loss might have been greater than the gain. Hardy goes back on that last sentence about the loss may have been greater than the gain, rebuking himself for ridiculous sentimentalism and uh, saying that there was no gain at all when the college at Kumbakonam rejected the one great man they have ever possessed, they had ever possessed, and the loss was irreparable. It's the worst instance that I know of the damage that can be done by an inefficient and inelastic educational system. I think that uh, is a very profound statement by Hardy, whether you agree with it or not, about what happens to genius or potential genius or those who don't believe in the characterization of people as geniuses can find their own term for these special gifts, but what an inelastic and rigid, unimaginative system does to talent, genius, etc., whatever you choose to call it. I think that's uh, very, very important, and he rebukes himself for uh, what he calls his ridiculous uh, uh, sentimentalism. He says is obviously not true. And this is one question I never tire of ra raising with mathematicians. Whoever they be, anyone, if I find any excuse, the first question I ask them is, uh, would Ramanujam have, been, uh, Ramanujam have been a greater mathematician, a more important figure, a more significant figure in the history of uh, modern mathematics, had he been tamed and given the kind of training that Hardy and Littlewood tried to give him in those few years he was at, uh, uh, in the UK at, at Cambridge. And uh, the answers are many. I do, I'm not, nobody, there's no unanimity on this question, to put it mildly. Uh, and I think you can forever uh, debate the question. I don't know what our translator, Professor Vanchinathan, thinks about this question. We'd love to hear him. Uh, it, it won't be in, his, in the translation, but uh, surely he has a view on this particular subject. I'd love to hear Professor Ragunathan uh, respond to that once again uh, on this occasion. Uh, but I think this, uh, this is an interesting question. What might have been? Then the question of creativity. I think it is fascinating. 
Uh, and I think Canigal's biography does full justice to this question. On the one hand, the intellectual rigor of uh, Hardy, and on the other, the, uh, uh, somebody who comes from a totally different stream or tradition, because Hardy asserts he's not a psychological freak. He's somebody who's perfectly rational. You took pleasure in his company. You would have tea with him. And uh, he would discuss politics as well as mathematics. He was not like some Id idiot savant and so on. Uh, this is clear, but they represent two different approaches. And yet, the collaboration was uh, truly one of the great stories in, uh, the, modern, uh, in the history of uh, modern science. Uh, apart from Hardy Littlewood, uh, Hardy Ramanujan, what they produce, I, I don't want to say anything about the mathematics it produced, but I've read that this is one of the most uh, fruitful partnerships, one of the most uh, interesting uh, partnerships uh, or collaborations uh, in, the history, in, the, in the modern history of uh, science, certainly mathematics. And when you talk about creativity, both were that, uh, both were highly creative, Hardy can claim a lot of uh, credit for recognizing the genius of Ramanujan, the great importance of his work, and at the same time, uh, the importance of uh, training him in modern methods and so on. One other thing interests me, and I will stop uh, the question of age. Hardy asserts uh, that mathematics uh, in, in this uh, in the Harvard lectures that uh, mathematicians need to do all their best work between the ages of 18 and 25. And uh, you can rec perhaps uh, you can say that about sports. People get very old when they're in the 30s. You'll see it in cricket, see it in women's tennis, and so on. Uh, but there are fields like chess where you can go on much longer. But I, don't, I wonder whether this is true about mathematics. Hardy, who normally demanded rigorous proof asserted without any proof uh, when they get into their 30s are old people who are already in decline. And uh, C.P. Snow in his uh, introduction, in his wonderful introduction to apology, a mathematician's apology, points out what a melancholy, hauntingly melancholy book this is. Beautifully done, but somebody who's passed his prime looking at mathematics beautifully but uh, there's a certain sadness about the whole experience of writing it and reading it, it appears. So Hardy's assertion that uh, Ramanujan's, it was not Ramanujan's death that was the, that was the greatest tragedy, but the five lost years, five or six lost years, where the system uh, distorted his uh, genius, uh, that was the greatest tragedy of Ramanujan's life and presumably his work, according to Hardy, how would you look at it today? Because we do know that there are mathematicians who continue to do fruitful and productive work uh, after that uh, period that Hardy uh, talked about. Has something changed in the nature of mathematics? Was Hardy just plainly wrong? Unlikely that Hardy was completely wrong at that time he was writing this or saying this. But I think these are questions that uh, arise. But uh, at the end of the day, we are profoundly grateful to Robert Canigal for uh, taking up this subject, a fine writer, a New Yorker writer, who, who, who spent all of five weeks in South India and came up with this uh, wonderful biography, uh, which continues to be read, which continues to be in print, and is now being translated, beginning to be translated in Indian languages for the people of India to read, other than those who can read English. So I'm very happy that uh, this is being offered to us today and proud to be a part of uh, this, this launch. Thank you very much. And for the National Book Trust, special word of thanks. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how many publishers would have brought it out uh, so quickly and so willingly. So I think we, you are still a very important part of the Indian publishing experience. Thank you, sir. Perasred P. Vanchanathan Avargalai Noolin Arimugore Ali Kumar Arikiren.
தலைமையேற்ற வந்திருக்கும் திரு ராம் அவர்களே பேராசிரியர்களே இங்கு அவையில் குடியிருக்கும் மற்ற நண்பர்களே பெரியவர்களே என்னுடைய பங்கு இது ஆங்கிலத்திலிருந்து தமிழ் மொழி பரப்பது தான் அதற்கு மேலே பெரிதாக நான் ஒன்றும் செய்துவிடவில்லை ஆனாலும் கனிகளின் நூலை பற்றி ஒன்றை நான் சொல்ல விரும்புகிறேன் அவர் வெறும் தொகுப்பாக எழுதாமல் அவன் வாழ்க்கையில் நேர்ந்தது என்ன எப்போது என்ன நடந்தது என்று என்று பேசாமல் சில விஷயங்களை அவர் தன்னுடைய கருத்தை கூறுகிறார் மற்றவர்கள் கூறிய கருத்துக்கு தன்னுடைய அதை விவாதித்து அதில் எது சரி எது தவறு என்று சொல்கிறார் அது மிகவும் முக்கியமான பகுதியாக நான் இந்த நூலில் நான் நினைக்கிறேன் ராம் அவர்கள் ஒன்று சொல்லிய ஒரு உதாரணமாக கிரியேட்டிவிட்டி பற்றி அவர் சொல்வது ஹார்டி அதை பற்றி கவலை படாதை பற்றி இவர் வருத்தப்படுகிறார் கணிகள் எப்படி ஒருவருக்கு சுயமாக சிந்திக்கும் திறன் எங்கேருந்து வருகிறது என்பதை பற்றி ஹார்டி ஆர்வம் காட்டவில்லை என்று அவர் குறைப்படுகிறார் எவ்வளவு தூரம் அவர் கணி இந்த மேத்தமெட்டிஷியன் சப்பாலஜி என்ற நூலை ஹார்டி எழுதியிருந்தாலும் அதில் கணிதத்தை பற்றி தான் கணிதத்தை எழுதவில்லை அவர் கணிதத்தை பற்றி தான் எழுதியிருக்கிறார் அப்படியும் எங்கிருந்து தோன்றுகிறது என்பதை பற்றி அவர் இறங்கவே இல்லை என்று அவர் வருத்தப்படுகிறார் இதை ஒரு முக்கியமான இது இந்த கணிகள் சொல்வது என்ன என்றால் ராமானுஜனுடைய மத நம்பிக்கை ஹார்டிய ஹார்டியோட முக்கியமான இது உலகம் எல்லாரும் ஏற்றுக்கொள்ளும்படி கடவுள் இல்லை என்று நிரூபிக்க வேண்டும் ஹார்டி தன்னுடைய முக்கியமான குறிக்கோளாக இருந்தார் என்னுடைய புது வருஷத்துக்கு நான் செய்ய வேண்டிய சாதனை என்னன்னா மக்கள் எல்லாரும் ஏற்றுக்கிற மாதிரி கடவுள் இல்லைன்னு நிரூபிச்சிடணும் அது அவருடைய இது ஆனால் ராமானுஜன் அப்படி இல்லை அவர் ரொம்ப பக்தியானவர் அதை பற்றி ரெண்டு விதமாக கருத்து வந்திருக்கு அதை நல்ல அவர் அலசுகிறார் ஏன்னா என்னென்னா ராமானுஜர் வந்து பழக்க வழக்கத்தில் தான் அவர் பக்திமான் சும்மா காலை எழுந்திச்சு குளிக்கிறது என்ன பண்ணுறது பூஜை பண்ணுறது அந்த மாதிரி இது தான் அவர் உண்மையிலேயே இது ஒரு தீ ஒரு தீவிரமாக பற்றி அவர் யோசிச்ச மகத்தை பற்றி யோசிச்சு அவர் இல்லைன்னுட்டு ஹார்டி சொல்வார் அது ஹார்டி சொல்கிறது அது இதை வந்து இவர் விவாதிக்கிறார் அது ரொம்ப எனக்கு முக்கியமான இதாக இருக்கும் இந்த புத்தகத்தில் எப்படி அது உண்மையிலே ராமானுஜர் வந்து வெறும் வெளித்தோட்டத்துக்கு பழக்க வழக்கம் மட்டும் செஞ்சவரா இல்லை அதை பற்றி நினைச்சவரான்னு எல்லாத்தையும் ஆதாரம் நிறைய கொடுக்குறார் ஒரு அதில் முக்கியமானது என்னென்னா திருவிழிக்கணியில் ட்ராம் வண்டி ட்ராம் வண்டி ஓடின காலம் இந்த இங்கே கணிகள் பார்த்தீங்கன்னா ட்ராம் வண்டியில் போகும்போது சும்மா ஒரு பேரில் தான் வருது அது ட்ராம் வண்டி ஓட பிராக்கெட்டில் வந்து ட்ராம் வண்டிகள் சென்னையில் இந்த வருடத்தில் இருந்து ஓட ஆரம்பித்தேன்னு அது கொடுக்குறார் அவ்வளோ அவ்வளோ தூரம் அது அதை பற்றி எழுதுறார் அதில் என்னென்னா அந்த ட்ராம் வண்டி ஓட்டுறவர் அப்பப்போ திடீர் திடீர்னுட்டு வண்டியை நிறுத்துறது திடீர் திடீர்னு வண்டியை வேகமாக ஓட்டுறது இதுமாதிரி குலுக்கி குலுக்கிட்டே இப்போ ஓட்டிகிட்டு இருந்திருக்காரு இப்போ ராமானுஜன் பக்கத்தில் வந்து சொல்கிறான் இவன் வந்து புதுசாக அந்த வண்டியை ஓட்டுறவர் த இது ஃபுல்லும் தன்னுடைய கண்ட்ரோலில் இருக்குது தன்னுடைய கட்டுப்பாட்டில் இருக்குதுன்னு அவர் நினச்சிட்டு இருக்க அறியாமையில் இருக்கார் அது கட்டுக்காட்டு இந்த மேலே ஓட்டுற கம்பியிலேருந்து வருது அந்த சக்தியிலேருந்து வருது இது அவனுக்கு தெரியாமல் இருக்கிறான் அப்படின்னு அவர் சொல்கிறார் இந்த மாதிரி பேசுகிற ராமானுஜர் வந்து இன்றைக்கு உண்மையிலேயே அவர் அது எப்படி அவர் சொல்ல விற்க வந்து ஒரு ஒரு உண்மையிலே மத நம்பிக்கை உள்ளவர்லாம் இது மாதிரி நிறையா உதாரணங்கள் அவர் கொடுக்குறார் இது 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 ஒன்று தான் கணிக்கல்ல எங்கேயும் ஃபுல்லும் அவருடைய அவருடைய அவர் ஒரு ஒரு கொள்ளைக்கு உதாரணம் காட்டுறார் எது எதையாவது ஒன்று சொல்கிறாருன்னா ராமானுஜன் மத நம்பிக்கை உள்ளவர்ன்னா அதுக்கு நிறைய உதாரணம் ஆதாரங்கள் அங்கெல்லாம் திரட்டி கொடுக்குறார் ஓகே திரு ராம் அவர்கள் வெளியூர் செல்லும் அவசரத்தில் இருக்கதால் கிளம்பிவிட்டார் அவர் இது மாதிரி ரா ராமானுஜன் வந்து அவருடைய மத நம்பிக்கையை பிரித்து பார்க்கக்கூடாது அப்படிங்கிற அதுக்கு இன்னொன்று கூட அவர் சொல்கிறார் என்னால் ராமானுஜன் சில ராமானுஜன் ஜோதிடர் மேல் நம்பிக்கை எல்லா நம்ம சாதாரண மூட நம்பிக்கை எல்லாம் சொல்லுவோமோ அதில் எல்லாத்துலேயும் அவருக்கு நம்பிக்கை இருக்குது அப்படின்னு அதனால் வந்து இவர் ஏமாளியாக இருக்கா பைத்தியக்காரர் தான் இருக்கானே அப்படின்னு கூட எல்லாம் நினைக்கிற மாதிரி அவருடைய குணாசியர் இருக்கு ஒரு ஒரு விதத்தில் எருமையார அடவரா ராமானுஜர் இருந்திருக்கார் ஒரு கும்பகோணத்தில் ஒரு பைத்தியக்காரன் ஒரு ஆத்தங்கரையில் எழுத இருப்பாரான் உழைக்கிட்டே இருப்பாரான் 
எல்லாரும் எவ்வளோ பைத்தியக்காரம் வாரிட்டு இருக்கான்ட்டு சத்தியம் சார் ரொம்ப அவ்வளோ சில இந்த ஒரு சண்டிகையெல்லாம் கட்டி போட்டிருக்காங்க அப்படிப்பட்டவனா ராமானுஜம் வந்து இல்லை இல்லை அவன் விஷயம் நிறைய சொல்கிறாரு அப்படின்னு ராமானுஜம் நினைக்கிறார் இப்படி இப்படி ஏமானியாக ராமானுஜம் இருக்கானே அப்படிங்கிறத வந்து கணிகள் சொல்கிறார் நம்ம எல்லோரும் ஒரு ஒரு விதத்துலே நம்ம நினைக்கிறோம் ராமானுஜன் வந்து அந்த ஏமாளி எளிமையாக இருக்கிறதால முன் தீர்மான எதுவும் அவருக்கு இல்லை அந்த அதனால் வந்து அவரால் அவரால் அவர் அவரோட மனதுக்கு நிறைய திறந்த நிலையில் இருக்கிறதால நிறையா அவருக்கு கருத்துக்கள் எல்லாம் உ உதிக்குது எப்படின்னு நிறையா சொல்கிறார் அதே ராமானுஜோட மத நம்பிக்கை பற்றி பேசுகிறது தான் அவருடைய இந்த புத்தகத்தில் நான் ரொம்ப நினைக்கிறேன் அப்புறம் ஹார்டியும் இருக்கும் ஹார்டி எப்படி அவர் புரிஞ்சுக்காமல் போனார்னு தான் அவருக்கு ரொம்ப வருத்தப்படுறார் அவ்வளோ பக்கத்தில் இருந்து அதையும் இழக்கிறார் ஏன் இப்படி ஹார்டி ஹார்டி அவர் அவ்வளோ கிட்டே இருந்தால் அதை புரிஞ்சிக்கலங்கிறது நல்லா விளக்குறார் ஸோ இது இந்த இந்த ரெண்டு மூணு விஷயம் தான் எனக்கு இந்த கணைகளோட புத்தகத்தில் ரொம்ப நான் அதிர்ச்சி அதிர்ச்சி இதெல்லாம் இது அதிசயமாக பார்க்குறது இது ரெண்டு இப்போ தான் ரெண்டு மூணு பகுதியில் அதுலேருந்து நான் படிக்க ரொம்ப நேரம் தாழ்ந்து விட்டது ஆனால் ரெண்டு மூணு பகுதியில் வேகமாக படித்து விட்டு முடிச்சுக்கணும் நீங்கள் வரீங்களா பதினாறு வயதில் ராமானுஜன் தேர்வுகளில் தோல்வியடைந்த காலம் எல்லோரும் தனிப்பட்ட முறையில் ராமானுஜனை உயர்வாக கருதி வதித்தார்கள் ஆனால் ஒட்டுமொத்தமாக பார்க்கும்போது அரசு நியதிகள் அவனுக்கு இடம் கொடுக்கவில்லை தாக்கரே பயன் பயப்படுகின்ற துடிப்பான மேல் நோக்கும் மனோபாவம் கொண்டவர்களை செம்மைப்படுத்த இந்த கல்வி முறை உருவாக்கப்படவில்லை செம்மைப்படுத்த இந்த கல்வி முறை உருவாக்கப்படவில்லை ஆங்கில எஜமானர்களுக்கு இந்நாட்டை கட்டிக்காக்க உதவுபவர்களே உருவாக்குவதே இக்கல்வியின் நோக்கம் அந்த வழியில் பார்க்கும் பொழுது ஆயிரத்தி தொள்ளாயிரத்தி நான்கிலிருந்து ஆயிரத்தி தொள்ளாயிரத்தி ஒன்பது வரை வரையான ஐந்தாண்டுகளை ராமானுஜன் கல்லூரியில் இடமில்லாமல் பட்டம் வாங்காமல் வேலை எதுவும் இல்லாமல் உலகின் பிற கணித அறிஞர்களுடன் தொடர்பு இல்லாமல் வீணாக்கினான் ஆனாலும் இதை கோப்பை பாதி காலியாக இருக்கிறது என்பதா பாதி நிரம்பி இருக்கிறது என்பதா பல ஆண்டுகள் அப்படி ராமானுஜன் நட்டாற்றில் தத்தளித்தான் அதனால் ஏற்பட்ட கஷ்டங்களும் அறிவார்ந்த முயற்சியில் தனித்து விடப்பட்டதும் அவனுக்கு நல்ல பலனை தந்ததா அவனுடைய திறமையையும் சுய சிந்தனையாற்றலையும் அவை கொழுந்து விட்டறிய செய்தனவா இந்தியாவில் யாரும் இந்த கோணத்தில் சிந்திக்கவில்லை ஆனால் நடந்தது அதுதான் ஒழுங்குபடுத்தப்பட்ட கல்வி முறையில் அடைந்த தோல்வி அவனை புதிய நோக்கில் செயல்பட வைத்தது சம்பிரதாயமான கல்வி முறைகளும் நியதிகளும் அவனுடைய முன்னேற்றத்துக்கு இடைஞ்சலாய் இருந்திருக்கிறோம் ஐந்து ஆண்டுகளை அவன் முழுவதும் தனியாலாக கணிதத்தில் நீந்தி கழித்தான் அவனை வழிநடத்த யாரும் இல்லை தூண்டிவிட ஏதும் இல்லை ஏதோ டியூஷன் நடத்தியதில் வரும் சொற்ப தொகை தவிர எந்த வருவாயும் இல்லை ஆனால் இப்படி அவன் வீட்டுக்கு பாரமா இருந்தாலும் ராமானுஜனை குடும்பத்தினர் அவன் போக்கில் விட்டனர் இந்திய மக்கள் சன்னியாசிகளை தனிமை விரும்பும் மேதைகளை அவர்களுக்கென்று இடம் கொடுத்து ஏற்றுக்கொள்வது வழக்கம் எனலாம் என்னுடைய நண்பர்கள் அவனுடைய அம்மா ஏன் அப்பா கூட அவனை அதை செய் இதை செய் சம்பாதிக்கும் வழியை பார் என்றெல்லாம் கட்டாயப்படுத்தவில்லை சொல்ல போனால் ஆயிரத்தி தொள்ளாயிரத்தி ஒன்பதுக்கு முந்தைய வருடங்கள் ராமானுஜனின் கவலையற்ற காலம் என்று நெவில் என்பவர் குறிப்பிடும்படி இருந்தன ஒரு விதத்தில் அந்த காலகட்டத்தில் அவன் பெருமளவில் தன் பணியை செய்து வந்தான் எனலாம் கணிதமே தான் வாழும் உலகம் என்றிருந்தான் அது அவனுக்கு மிகவும் வசதியாக அவனுடைய தாகத்தை தீர்த்து வைத்து உன்னதமான அழகை அவன் முன் விரித்து காட்டி மனநிறைவை தந்தது அந்த உலகை விட்டு வெளியே வர வேண்டும் என்று அவன் எண்ணவே இல்லை இது இப்போ ராம் கேட்ட கேள்விக்கு இந்த பகுதி உங்களுக்கு பதில் கொடுக்கும் அவர் ஒரு அஞ்சு வருஷம் காலேஜில் இடம் இல்லாமல் படிக்காமல் வீணா ஒரு அஞ்சு பதினெட்டுலேருந்து இருபத்தஞ்சி வயசு சமயத்தில் ராமனுடைய வந்து யாரும் கவனிக்கப்படாமல் இது மாதிரி தனியாக இருந்தாங்க இவர் கணிகள் அதுக்கு ஒரு வேறு விதமாக அதை மாற்றி சொல்கிறார் அந்த விஷயத்தில் அவனுக்கு சட்ட திட்டத்துக்கு உட்பட்ட க கல்வி இல்லாததால் தனிமையில் இருந்தாலும் அவன் தன் விருப்பம் போல் எல்லாத்தையும் செஞ்சான் அவர் 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 கொடுக்குறார் அந்த சுதந்திரமாக செயல்பட முடிஞ்சது அப்படின்னு அவர் சொல்கிறார் அதனால் பரவாயில்ல அது ஒரு அதில் நன்றையாக கூட இருக்கலாம் அப்படின்னு அவர் தன்னுடைய கருத்தை சொல்கிறார் அதுக்காக தான் இந்த பகுதியை நான் அப்படின்னு சொன்னேன் ராம் இது கேட்டிருந்தார் என்ன ஆச்சுன்னுட்டு அவர் இல்லை ராமானுஜனின் கடிதத்தை ஹாடியும் லிட்டிலுடும் படித்தது பார்க்க பார்க்க அவர்கள் இருவரும் அந்த சூத்திரங்களால் பிரமித்து போனார்கள் இதை பற்றி பின்னர் அறிந்த இஎச் நெவல் ராமானுஜம் நிர்பணம் அளிக்காமல் 
தந்த சூத்திரங்களை உலகத்தின் எந்த கடுமையான கணித தேர்விலும் கேள்வியாக கேட்க முடியாது என்று பாராட்டி கூறுகிறார் என் வாழ்நாளில் எனக்கு வந்த கடிதங்களிலேயே மிகவும் முக்கியமான கடிதம் நிச்சயமாக அதுதான் அந்த கடிதத்தை எழுதிய கணித அறிஞன் ஒப்பற்ற தரமானவன் உயர்வான சுய சிந்தனையும் சக்தியும் உடையவன் என்று ஹாடி கூறுகிறார் இது வந்து ஹார்டி ராமானுஜனுக்கு பதில் கடிதம் எழுதுனதுக்கப்புறம் ராமானுஜன் எனக்கு உதவி கேட்டு ஹார்டிக்கு எழுதுறாரு நான் நிறையா ஆராய்ச்சி செஞ்சுட்ருக்கேன் இதை பதிப்பிக்க எனக்கு உதவி பண்ணுங்க அப்படின்ட்டு அதுக்கு பதில் அதெல்லாம் படிச்சுட்டு எழுதுறாரு அதுக்கப்புறம் அது வரைக்கும் சரியான வேலை இல்லாமல் கடைசியாக ஒரு துறைமுகத்தில் ஒரு சின்ன வேலை கிடைச்சி முப்பது ரூபா சம்பளத்தில் வேலை செஞ்சிட்ருக்கப்ப இது வந்துடுச்சு ஹார்டிட்டேருந்து ஒரு ஒரு பாராட்டி கடிதம் வந்துச்சு அப்போ நடந்தது பொறியியல் கல்லூரி பேராசிரியர் ஹனுமந்தராவ் கணித பாடங்களுக்கான உயர்மட்ட குழுவின் கூட்டத்திற்கு நாராயண ஐயரை வரவழைத்தார் இந்த எஸ் ராமானுஜனுக்கு என்ன செய்யலாம் அவருடைய ஆராய்ச்சியை நீங்கள் பார்த்திருக்கிறீர்கள் அவரை விட நீங்கள் தான் அதை எங்களை புரிய வைக்க முடியும் என்றார் உயர்மட்ட குழு ராமானுஜனுக்கு மாதம் எழுபத்தைந்து ரூபாய் விதைத்தொகை அடுத்த இரண்டு ஆண்டுகளுக்கு வழங்கும்படி பல்கலைக்கழகத்தின் ஆட்சிக்குழுவுக்கு பரிந்துரைத்தது அது ராமானுஜனுக்கு துறைமுக விலையில் கிடைத்த சம்பளத்தை விட இரண்டு மடங்குக்கும் அதிகமான தொகை பல்கலைக்கழக ஆட்சிக்குழு ஏப்ரல் ஏழாம் தேதி என்று கூடிய போது இதற்கு முட்டுக்கட்டை போடப்பட்டது இது போன்ற உதவித்தொகை எல்லாம் எம்ஏ படித்து முடித்தவர்களுக்கு தானே கொடுக்க வேண்டும் ராமானுஜனோ பட்டதாரி கூட இல்லை அவர் எழுதிய எல்லா கல்லூரி தேர்வுகளிலும் தோல்வியே கண்டவர் ஆக்ஸ்போர்டில் படித்து அப்போது பிரசிடென்சி கல்லூரியில் பேராசிரியராக பணி செய்த ரிச்சர்ட் ரிட்டில் ஹைல்ஸ் என்பவர் தான் இதை முடக்க பார்த்தார் பின்னாளில் அவர் ராமானுஜனை தூக்கி பிடித்தவர் என்றாலும் அன்று அவர் விதிகளை கூறி உதவித்தொகை அவருக்கு கொடுக்கக்கூடாது என்றார் அவரை பலர் எதிர்த்து பேசிய போதும் அவர் இடம் கொடுக்கவில்லை அப்போது ஆட்சிக்குழுவின் தலைவர் பி ஆர் சுந்தரம் ஐயர் அவர் சென்னை உயர்நீதிமன்றத்தின் தலைமை நீதிபதி பதவியும் வைத்துக் கொண்டிருந்தார் பி ஆர் சுந்தரமே அப்போது குடுக்கிட்டார் பல்கலைக்கழகத்தின் முக்கியமான நோக்கம் என்பது ஆராய்ச்சியில் முன்னேறுவது தானே என்று கேட்டார் ராமானுஜனுடைய கல்வி தகுதிகளில் என்னதான் குளறுபடிகள் இருந்தாலும் அவர் ஆராய்ச்சி நடத்தி காட்டியவர் தானே அந்த வாதம் எதிர்ப்புகளை தவிடுபடியாக்கியது பல்கலைக்கழகத்தின் விதிமுறைகள் தற்போது இதுபோன்ற உதவித்தொகைக்கு இடம் கொடுக்கவில்லை ஆனால் ஆயிரத்தி தொள்ளாயிரத்தி நான்காம் ஆண்டின் இந்திய பல்கலைக்கழக சட்டப்பிரிவு மூன்றும் பல்கலைக்கழக அமைப்பு சட்டம் பதினைந்தும் அதுபோன்ற உதவித்தொகையை ஜார்ஜ் கோட்டையில் வீட்டிற்கும் ஆளுநரின் நேரடி போதில் இருந்தால் அளிக்கலாம் என்று பல்கலைக்கழக பதிவாளர் எழுதினார் ஹார்டியின் கடிதம் வந்த ஆறு வாரங்களில் ராமானுஜனை ஆதரிக்கும் வகையில் சென்னையின் போக்கே எப்படி தலையீடாக மாறியது என்பதை இது காட்டுகிறது இப்போது அதிகாரிகள் விதிகளை எப்படி ராமானுஜருக்கு பயன்படி வகையில் மாற்றி புரிந்து கொள்ளலாம் என்று நினைக்க தயாரானார்கள் இத்துடன் இந்த படிக்கும் பகுதி நிறைவேறுகிறது for this popular talk and in fact most of the time when people are asked about name an indian mathematician they would say raguna <laughs> they would say sinos ramana you know that is a second name and uh, they would probably wonder where is the second name that they is coming to but that is exactly not true there has been a lot of indian mathematicians even after raguna uh, <laughs> <laughs> after serious ramanujan who have done probably many subjects particularly those who are immediately after ramanujan did in number theory but even other subjects they did and this is unfortunately not known to many of the younger generation that there has been a lot of mathematicians and that would be essentially the main topic of professor raghunathan's talk of who are the mathematicians more or less immediately after Srinivas Ravanja about to be whom the younger generation should really know. Thank you for your introduction. <coughs> This uh, night can switch it off. I have 
change the title from what you found on the invitation cards. <coughs> but it essentially means the same. I was talking about there I had said some 20th century Indian mathematicians. Like I just replaced the word mathematicians by courtiers of the queen of sciences. As you all know, the queen of sciences is mathematics and that is the man who said that. Oh, can this be brought down? It is going to hide some things at every point. Ah, you can raise that, okay. That that will be good. Uh, it's quite heavy, I think. It's difficult to remove it. You know, Gauss is considered the greatest math is the greatest mathematician of all times. And uh, he was also interested in other sciences, but he of course considered mathematics as the queen of sciences, that's what he called it. And uh, it is indeed bears the resemblance to the office of the queen in many ways. I mean th that calling it the queen of, math queen of science is really appropriate for various reasons. So Carl Friedrich Gauss is his full name. <coughs> Mathematics does indeed display many of the qualities of the royal personage, <coughs> the queen. First, Royalty is usually aloof. The aloofness is a quality which everyone recognizes in royalty. <coughs> and it does, mathematics does stand a little apart from other sciences. In fact, if you look at the title of Newton's great work, it says Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. Natural philosophy, of course, means science, and it says mathematical principles, so it stands outside math, other sciences in some sense. And let me show you the frontispiece of the first edition of Newton's great book. The title of course is in Latin, Philosophy Naturalis Principia Mathematica. I do not, I am not sure if my pronunciation is right, but once I was told it should be Principia by Eshton the Shaker. I said when I told him, when I, when I mentioned the book as Principia, he corrected me and said it is Principia. <laughs> anyway, so that is the front is and mathematics is whimsical. Queens are generally supposed to be whimsical. <laughs> and mathematics is whimsical in what sense? You know, the way mathematics develops, it is uh, never been predictable. It uh, develops in very really unpredictable ways. It does get some, you know, its development is largely the result of an internal dynamic. It does get some inspiration from other sources, physics in particular, from the physical world, it draws inspiration. But often, Mathematical areas that start that way take a life of their own, severing all connections with the source. It is no longer interested in where it came from, it develops on its own. That has happened repeatedly. There are many examples, but I will not go into it. Whimsical, but not quite as arbitrary as the Queen in Alice in Wonderland. I will show you a picture of the Queen in the Alice in Wonderland, which I took out from the internet. It is ugly as ugly can be in this picture. I do not know if. Uh, in Louis Carroll's own drawings, she was this ugly. I am not sure. But anyway, but the queen, on the other hand, in popular imaginations, is beautiful. <coughs> well, <coughs> the foremost quality that the popular mind attributes to the queen is beauty. It's, I mean, even the beauty pageants, they are called beauty queens, after all. So <laughs> that is the popular idea of a queen. <coughs> and mathematics is beautiful. And I do not have to tell this to mathematicians around here, but there are, I expect, some non mathematicians. And I must emphasize mathematics is beautiful. A thing of beauty is a joy forever, says the poet. This is a famous quotation from Keats. <coughs> and if that is a Euclid's Elements, the book Euclid's Elements has few equals when it comes to providing joy. It has done that for generations of, math of mathematicians, if you like. Or, or even non mathematicians occasionally. I mean, many, many people in school, when they first come across uh, Euclid's geometry, are very fascinated. They find it beautiful. <coughs> and it has done that for generations. So it is a joy forever, it is certainly applicable to that. And to quote Bertrand Russell, mathematics rightly viewed possesses not only truth, but supreme beauty. Beauty, cold and austere, like that of sculpture, without appeal to our weaker nature without the gorgeous trappings of painting or music and capable of stern perfection such as only the great, greatest art can show. That is 
from Bertrand Russell. So mathematics is beautiful and the queen in history with rare exceptions like the Elizabeth of England, the first of England or the Catherine the Great of Russia has had largely a decorative role. They never wielded much power. Such power as they wielded was marginal and in any case indirect. And the queen's preoccupations were largely material for page 3 of our newspapers. <coughs> While the king is into serious business counting out his money, the queen is in the parlor eating bread and honey. Certain self-indulgence which I suppose is also characteristic of mathematics in a way. <coughs> so it is no wonder that mathematicians the queen's courtiers unlike their counterparts in physics or chemistry or biology seldom attract public attention. Well, the, that uh, I must say that uh, being the mathematics being called queen of sciences is not objected to by most other scientists. The reason is clearly this, the queen is only a page 3 personality and it is the king that counts. So, and I suppose the physicists the, the imagine their own discipline is the king and so do chemists and biologists. So, it would not matter. <coughs> Anyway, so that is the queen, I took, again it comes out of the internet eating bread and honey, I could not find a better picture than that, but anyway. At the beginning of the 20th century, scientists in any field were largely reclusive intellectuals, well out of the public gaze, but all that changed by the middle of the century. They changed drastically thanks to developments in nu nuclear physics explosively if you like with the Hiroshima event and the Sputnik space science came into focus and so on. So and many scientists became iconic figures, role models for the youth, objects of public adulation. In this context of this hype about scientists, the mathematician is best described by the Tamil proverb. proverb. In Tamil it goes like Kubera Patanum Kola Pohacha, of Chombo Kondo Raman. So after taking part in a raid on Kubera's Alakapuri, the guy brought back a tin vessel. That is the <coughs> so that is what the mathematician has done while other scientists have become well known. And but the one Indian mathematician who defied that general rule was of course Srinivas Ramanujan. And I will begin with him but go on to talk about other stalwarts on the Indian scene, men of substantial achievement even if they did not scale the heights that Ramanujan did. <coughs> Actually I will not say much about Ramanujan, practically everyone knows the romantic story of his passage of the passage of the indigent Clark from Chennai to the ivory towers of Cambridge. So before I start on Ramanujan however, I want to say a few words about mathematics in India in general and the situation when Ramanujan appeared on the scene. Our country of course has a long tradition of engagement with mathematics, evidently the architectural competence of the Indus Valley civilization indicates an acquaintance with mathematics already. But then there is a break, we can claim a continuous tradition only from the Vedic period. Interesting contributions to geometry including the Pythagoras theorem are found in the Bauda and the Sulba Sutra dating back to the 7th century BC. <coughs> well, uh, I must at this point maybe say a few words uh, about what is called Vedic mathematics. It is neither Vedic nor mathematics really. It is a bunch of calculating rules, I mean what is popularly known as Vedic mathematics is a bunch of calculating rules invented by latter day Shankaracharya who quotes obscure verses whose meanings he interprets as mathematical calculation rules. But it is not genuinely Vedic. But we have plenty of mathematics in the Vedic period of which we can be proud of. All this the so called Vedic mathematics is not really all that interesting, but there is good stuff back there. Landmark developments for which we have some records, you know, historical records in our country everybody knows are very poor in general. There are some periods where there are landmark developments and we have records of them. This especially during the period 400 to 700 AD, there is this Bakshali manuscript which is discovered uh, in somewhere in present day Pakistan which already indicates that maybe there is some knowledge of uh, 0 as a number, the Bakshali manuscript. The manuscript is in uh, housed in a library in Cambridge and it is uh, very difficult to get access to it. The librarians are sometimes a very possessive lot, they do not let anybody else go anywhere near the precious documents they own. 
Aryabhatta and Brahmagupta are well known names. Aryabhatta lived the 6th century and Brahmagupta the 7th centuries and they made tremendous progress in mathematics. Curiously enough, our mathematicians of this early period and in fact even long after the advent of Islam seem to have been unaware of Greek mathematics. They did not know anything about Euclid. Right down to even Bhaskara did not does not seem to have known anything about Euclid. There is no influence of Greek mathematics on Indian mathematics through the entire period even after the advent of Islam in India. I am mentioning Islam specifically because the Arab scholars are the ones who preserved Euclid. You know Greece had forgotten Euclid. Had for Euclid's elements in the original Greek were not available uh, soon after uh, Euclid. It is a, it, in modern days people got to know about Euclid and say uh, during the European Renaissance days they got to know about Euclid only through Arab trans Arabic translations done by Arabic scholars. And so Arabic scholars knew well about Sanskrit and they had interaction with India after the Islamic advent. Even through them our people do not seem to have learnt anything about Euclid. The knowledge direction is always seems to have been from India. The Arabs picked up a lot from India but we never picked up anything from the Arabs. It is a, a strange phenomenon I cannot understand why that happens. Anyway, uh, Alexander's campaign brought him to India but it does and his, uh, and his teacher was Aristotle. Despite that, there seems to have been no connection, no, no intellectual influence on India. Everyone sees in history books uh, that nice uh, photograph of sculpture of Buddha, an example of Gandhara art. So, Greek art did influence Indian art, but Greek intellectual activity like mathematics does not seem to have. And Greek astrology of all things has influenced India. Our uh, zodiacal signs and so on, we borrowed from the Greeks. They could have picked up something better to pick up from them, but anyway, there it is. And Bhaskara II is a well known name, yes, mainly because of his great book, Lilavati, which is the most popular mathematical work since the advent in the 12th century. And the next landmark period is a remarkable work, essentially, the discovery of calculus by Madhava of the Kerala school. This happened during the 13th to 15th centuries. During those two centuries, there was tremendous work going on in uh, Kerala where essentially two centuries before Newton, three centuries before Newton, Madhava had discovered the calculus, both differential and integral calculus in a certain form. It, it was not as, uh, as complete or as satisfactory as what Newton had developed, but basic ideas of calculus were already developed. The pursuit of mathematics or for that matter all intellectual pursuits took a backseat in the country after this burst of energy in the Kerala school. One had to wait for its vigorous revival till after the arrival of western style educational institutions in this country. In fact, it is only after that western style educations arrived in this country, Euclid began to be taught at many institutions in colleges which followed the western style and so on. Uh, curiously, uh, in the early 18th, uh, early 19th century or maybe late uh, 18th century, there is a record of madrasas teaching Euclid, Plato and Aristotle, madrasas in Delhi, but uh, does not seem to have permeated the, the Hindu or Brahminical educational system. <coughs> the Bengal Renaissance of the 19th century also saw a renewal of interest in higher mathematics with Indians now armed with knowledge of developments in Europe in the modern period. Here are the names of Indian mathematicians who made a mark on the Indian scene before Ramanujan arrived on the scene. Ganesh Prasad. Ganesh Prasad uh, was essentially from UP. <coughs> he did some work in what is called applied mathematics and uh, in fact uh, he seems to have had contact with uh, outstanding German mathematicians, Sommerfeld in particular I think. And Shamatas Mukhopadhyaya, uh, he was a geometer and perhaps uh, the first Indian to prove what is a theorem in what is known as global differential geometry. There is something called the four vertex theorem of Mukhopadhyaya, which uh, instantly it, its centenary was celebrated with some fanfare uh, in some uh, American universities some three or four years ago. Uh, Ramaswamy Iyer. He was only, only a well known figure locally. Mukhopadhyay was uh, because, and Ganesh Prasad were already known outside India. 
Ramaswamy Iyer is a founder of the Indian Mathematical Society. He was not a he was not a professional mathematician. He was not a professional teacher of mathematics. He was a collector, a sub collector of some districts in the administrative civil civil administrative service of the Madras province of the British days. And he started the Indian Mathematical Society. The first society was started with twenty members. All of them personal friends of Ramaswamy to whom he wrote, and they collected. They they decided to subscribe. Paid some money and decided to subscribe to some journals, some half a dozen journals, which they circulated among themselves because they were located in different places. That's how the society started functioning. Uh, so they had uh, members from Pune, members from ba Bangalore, members from Chennai. I did not extend beyond uh, the Vindhyas. Vasudev Mukherjee is a well-known name. Uh, uh, Ramchandra Rao was uh, also uh, one of the. People who joined Ramasam Iyer in founding the society. Uh, oh no! What happened? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Ashutosh Mukherjee is a well-known name. He was the vice chancellor of uh, Calcutta University. He is also a mathematician. He founded the Calcutta Mathematical Society. Uh, Ramaswamy Iyer founded the Indian Mathematical Society in 1906, but it was called the Mathematics Club, is what he called it. And uh, Ashutosh Mukherjee, the next year, started the Calcutta Mathematical Society and the Full Fledged Society. Ashutosh Mukherjee, uh, Ram, Ram, the name Mathematics Club was changed to Mathematics Indian Mathematical Society in 1908 or 1909. I don't remember the exact date. But so. With the present name, the Indian Mathematical Society is a year younger than the Calcutta Mathematical Society. But if you count the Mathematics Club as the originator, it is the oldest society. The first issue of uh, the Indian Mathematical Society's journal uh, carries a paper by C. B. Raman. It's, of course, it's, there is no serious mathematics in it, but it's very uh, ordinary mathematics applied to some situation, but appears in the journal. At that time, uh, there was the only uh, so, uh, subject, so scientific subject which had a society was mathematics in India. It is the first society, to be, professional society to be formed. Ramachandra Rao is also the beneficiary of uh, Ramanujan as many of you may know. <coughs> okay, that is Srinivas Ramanujan's photograph. There are not too many photographs of Ramanujan available. There are two or three photographs and none of them particularly good. And Next to him, I have also juxtaposed the photograph with that of Hardy because their mathematics was more almost inseparable in the later period, later years. <coughs> well, Ramanujan, of course, uh, we all know about him. How uh, he wrote this famous letter to Hardy, which resulted in his going to Cambridge and becoming a <coughs> well-known mathematician. Uh, okay, uh, Ramanujan uh, was largely self-taught. He had only access to very mediocre books, if, the books which have become famous because he used them. One of them is called Car Synopsis, and it's only claim to greatness is uh, well, claim, claim, not even greatness. Claim to be well, becoming only reason for it's becoming well known is that Ramanujan used it. And uh, then, when he went to Cambridge, uh, in the in the beginning, Hardy was. Uh, did not know how to handle him, so to speak, and maybe right to the end, as was uh, pointed out in uh, earlier by Ram in his uh, talk. There is uh, one thing seems to be clear about Ramanujan. Ramanujan, uh, well, he was a uh, what should I say? He was artless, not a, not a very scheming kind of person, not a clever, smart that kind of person. He was literally artless, and. Uh, in some sense, uh, he was probably, at least in the early days, not when he went to Cambridge, was not fully aware of uh, how great a mathematician he was. Uh, of course, Hardy could see that he was a mathematician, and in, in, I like to say that Hardy acted as some kind of jambavan for Ramanujan's Hanuman. <coughs> and uh, Hardy, it, and it's very difficult to, I mean, you know, 
workings of Ramanujan's mind is very difficult for uh, other people to fathom. Many mathematicians think he was more a magician than a mathematician because his thought process was mysterious. Nevertheless, uh, Hardy does, did not think so. He only thought he, uh, there is no, for him, Ramanujan was not a mystery and I, I sus one suspects that probably he did not want to acknowledge that there could be some mystery there. And with his atheistic uh, uh, convictions, he probably did not like the idea of uh, associating something mystic with Ramanujan. In any case, uh, the, uh, the, the, you know, Ramanujan's life in uh, England was uh, made complicated uh, partly because of his vegetarianism, but also because um, is you know, he missed his family, so to speak, and uh, his letters written home never got any replies. And that was because, unfortunately, the mother had suppressed all letters written to the wife. And this caused considerable depression for him. And uh, also, certain things happened, like, for instance, his uh, name was proposed for the fellowship of uh, Trinity, the great college in uh, Cambridge, and it was turned down essentially because of racist reasons. And in the midst of, so because of such events and his poor health and so on, he was in a state of depression and he attempted a suicide. And uh, this was not known for a long time, but it's, it's now it's there in Kanigal's book and some, some other books as well. And what happened, he fell, he attempted suicide, he fell before a train and fortunately the guard stopped the train on time and he was uh, not killed. Hardy turned up there and uh, told the police, you know, uh, attempted suicide is a criminal offence in those days in England and the police were ready to, seem to, seem ready to arrest him and uh, Hardy turned up there and told them that uh, Raman was a fellow of the Royal Society and fellows of the Royal Society cannot be arrested. <coughs> that was the thing that uh, Hardy told them. This was not true, of course. The fellow of the Royal Society can be arrested, and Ramanujan was not a fellow of the Royal Society yet. He was going to become a fellow a month later, but at that time he was not a fellow of the Royal Society. Well, the, these white lies uh, seem to work, but as it turned, uh, turns out, some 20 years later, the same policeman who was uh, in charge at the time met Hardy and told him, "You know, we were not fooled by what you said, but we thought not worth pursuing it." That's his <laughs> story. So goes the story. Well, <coughs> uh, I don't think I want to say much more about Ramanujan except that this is mathematics. One of the one of his uh, great contributions is the a conjecture formulated about what is called the toe function. The toe function is defined like this. I mean, it's uh, you know you write down that equation and equate the coefficient of q power n on the left hand side. And right hand side, it's called tau n. So tau n is that coefficient. Never mind what it is. It, it became a very important uh, function later on in connection with number theory in the, in the theory of what is known as the modular forms. Uh, he made uh, two conjectures about it. One of them was promptly proved, very soon proved by a British mathematician by name Model, whose name is not very well known. I think he ought to be as well known as Hardy in this country, but he's not, uh, even in the mathematical community is what I mean. But anyway. So this was an uh, important function. The other, he was looking at functions on the set of integer. For every integer n, you have a number 2n. There is another function which is called the partition function, which also was important, uh, it's, uh, which also assumed great importance in number theory. And he, his contributions are, a uh, uh, large part of his contributions are towards examining this function and the earlier function 2n. Both these are uh, some of the most important contributions he made to mathematics. Now the British introduced the higher education in this country mainly for the purpose of producing human resources for their subordinate administrative services. Everyone who has read some history, is, would, at least in the old days, would be familiar with the so-called minutes of Macaulay where he says how all uh, scholarship, all, all uh, work done in India so by way of scholarship is not worth in English books on one shelf in his uh, room, some such thing. I don't, I don't forget, the, I forget the exact quotation, but it's a very well statement by Macaulay. And but he thought 
the only way to improve Indians is to introduce them to Western education and his main purpose was to make uh, brown skinned Britishers out of Indians who could manage their administrative service. Nevertheless, the system did give the students some exposure to advanced science in particular mathematics. Ramanujan himself benefited by access to some books even if they were mediocre would be because they were prescribed for the use of the college students. The university of the three universities Madras, Bombay and Calcutta had been started in 1857. It is an amazing thing that while they were fighting a war up north the mutiny in they felt self confident enough to start universities in Calcutta, Bombay and Madras. The, the British self confidence is really stunning. And to the talented students, the degree course of mathematics did offer something by way of preparation for the pursuit of mathematical research. Among the earliest to take that route to becoming mathematicians were K. Anand Rao and R. Vaidyarana Swami, about whom I will say a few words now. You see this, their photographs there, Anand Rao and Vaidya Swami. They were, Ramanujan was born in 1887, so Anand Rao was 6 years junior to him and Vaidyarana Swami was 7 years junior to Ramanujan. Anand Rao, went through unlike Ramarajan he had a very he came from a relatively opulent background and uh, he did very well in school and college went through the standard brilliant performances in all the examinations and so on and his family sent him to Cambridge to study mathematics with Hardy. He was in Cambridge when Ramarajan arrived there so they knew each other Ramarajan. and uh, another Rao one of the things that Anand Rao says is that uh, Ramanandan was a very simple person, artless and things that kind. He himself worked with Hardy. Hardy there, is, there is an area of mathematics called summability in which Hardy was a big expert. In fact, uh, Hardy had a book on divergence series which is referred to in Ramanandan's first letter to Hardy. Anyway, uh, Anand Rao worked under him and uh, he did quite well in Cambridge. He won uh, a coveted prize called the Smith's Prize. Uh, meant for uh, graduate students, uh, well students working for PhD for research papers. And there is even a theorem named after Anand Rao mentioned in Hardy's, one of Hardy's books. And uh, well, uh, Anand Rao completed his degree and came back and was immediately appointed professor of mathematics at Presidency College. The university at that time did not have a mathematics department. In fact, the university had at that time, in fact, you know, the University of Madras was formed in 1857, but it had no departments, teaching departments or research departments. There is only an examining body. So the it was modeled on London University, not Cambridge or Oxford. London University was a model, and it was only an examining body. And uh, some somewhere around uh, late, very end of the 19th century, is probably they had a department, they started a department of history, English, and something other kind. It is only and the mathematics department what has happened. Yeah. Uh, the mathematics department there is no mathematics department uh, <coughs> to start much later but anyway another Rao went and joined the presidency college and in those days all the teaching was done in affiliated colleges and presidency was one of the prestigious colleges at the time. C. V. Raman was uh, uh, <coughs> alumnus of the college and later Chandrasekhar. At, at the time when uh, Anand Rao was there, uh, Raman had all, uh, probably left, uh, at, uh, long since passed out of college uh, when uh, Anand Rao went to Presidency College. Anyway, he was a he was good teacher and many of his students about whom also some of his students I will speak about them. They held him in great respect and he was indeed a great teacher by all accounts. And next to him, the Vaidhira Swami is again a mathematician who uh, went to uh, England but not to the standard places, not Cambridge or Oxford. He went to, I do not remember which university he went to, I forget now. He went to some other university but picked up uh, mathematics which is quite different from what was the rage at Cambridge. Uh, Cambridge with a person like Hardy there, it was analysis and number theory that was his strength. Whereas Vaidhira Swami went, he picked up some geometry. And uh, he came back after a degree and he was the first appointment as a professor, uh, no, no, as a, as a reader in uh, 
mathematics at the university. That is the first university, de university department was started and he was appointed the first professor. An earlier attempt was made to start a department and uh, Ramanujan was supposed to be appointed as a professor but uh, Ramanujan died prematurely and so that did not happen then. It is only in 1931 or something when Vedana Swami had come back from England that he got a job as a professor, as, as a reader at Madras University. And uh, between them the two men guided many students and they created an atmosphere of uh, mathematical scholarship and activity in Madras. In fact at that time in the, in the 1930s uh, the most active place for mathematics, the two active places for mathematics, one was Calcutta and the other was Madras and in uh, many ways Madras had the lead thanks to these two people. Oh, before I, before I go on I must say uh, there is the, in those days the retirement age in the uh, government service was 56. So uh, you can see when he's, he long after, but Anandrao continued to work at mathematics long after he retired. 56 would, would mean what, uh, 1949 he must have retired, lived 17 years after that but he continued to do some interesting mathematics. And Vaidhana Swami, uh, well he retired from uh, the university as a reader, never got a promotion and uh, he, hmm? last year, last year he was made professor, sorry, yeah, last year he was made a professor and after retirement he spent some time at uh, Indian Statistical Institute in Calcutta. And both these men were responsible for many other young, at that time young Indian uh, students to take to mathematics and do research which is very worthwhile. <coughs> Our Vajrana Swami wrote a book on set topology, a subject which was still new even in Europe at that time and that, that, that book received, was, was very well received. The next mathematician I am going to talk about was a student of Anand Rao, his name is as you see S.S. Pillai and he had a very short life as you can see 1901 to 1950. Pillai <coughs> uh, had a, I mean we, uh, Ramanujan of course, uh, Ramanujan's life was something of a tragedy but Pillai was equally so, in some sense maybe it is worse. Pillai soon after his, he was born, even in his first year his mother passed away and uh, he went through school, uh, some old relative, woman relative was taking care of uh, the, fam the family <coughs> and in, in the final year of his school he lost his father as well. So he was orphaned at the, time, at the end, end of his schooling, luckily he had a teacher a man by name Shastriyar who was, uh, who became very fond of him because he was a very bright student and he helped him along with extended financial help and Pillai also secured a scholarship from Maharaja's college in Trivandrum. This was, he was living in Trivandrum at that time. And after his degree he moved to Chennai where he became a student of Anand Rao. Pillai worked in number theory. Uh, neither Anand Rao nor uh, uh, Vaidhinaya Swami were number theorists but Pillai was number theorist and probably the first number theorist after Ramanujan to have done really significant work. Well this is the, uh, I am just a few, say a few words about Pillai's work. The varying problem, there is a theorem of Hilbert proved in 1909 which says that take any number n, it can be written as a sum of R k k powers for some R k, fix, an, fix a number k, whole number k. So like for instance, um, well you can ask is a number a sum of two squares, is a number a sum of three squares and so on or cubes, fourth powers and so on. You can generally ask for any k, is there a number R k such that every number can be written as sum of R k, k powers. And the answer is affirmative, Hilbert said yes there is such an R k. And then once there is an RK, the split would go to a minimal RK. And the question, the varying problem is the determination of such a minimum, what is the exact RK there? And that number, the minimal number is called GK and I have now listed the numbers there. G1 equals 1, every number is just itself. G2 equals 4, that is the first important theorem proved by a famous uh, all time great mathematician Lagrange. G3 was 9, proved by Weifrich and Kempner, have I got the names right, Balu? Okay. 
and Pillai gave a formula for all gk k greater than or equal to 6. So 5 and 4 and 5 were open for a long time g5 you know not 5 5 was g5 was already determined by the Chinese mathematician Chen in 1936 and g4 as late as 1986 by our colleague Balas Brumnian who is here along with two Frenchmen this this year and dress. Anyway so the wearing problem was a problem which attracted wide attention and uh, immediately after we proved this uh, theorem we the SS pillar became quite well known all over the world and in 1950 invited to the International Congress of Mathematicians held at Harvard and after which he was also going to spend some time at the famous institute for advanced study in Princeton the institute where Albert Einstein worked. Misfortune struck him again tragedy the, he died in an air crash over Egypt while flying to Harvard to, to the United States. So it ended a very promising career rather abruptly at the age of 49 that was Minakshundram. So you see the, the, all these people uh, they were making waves in the 30s and even earlier the three people I mentioned now and now the next man well he is not really an Indian but why is this photograph here. <coughs> see because of Hardy's tremendous influence many people worked in areas which interested Hardy many people in India worked in areas which were close to Hardy's interests one was number theory of course the other was summability and this summability became a quite a fashion for some time but slowly this area was getting exhausted so to speak it is there were no more interesting exciting challenges in the area but nevertheless our Indian mathematicians continued to do that kind of thing. So in that context this man here Andre Vail who is one of the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century made the following comment Hardy spoiled a large number of Indian mathematicians but Ramanujan was too great for him to spoil <laughs> this was a statement by, made by Vail and that is just an element of truth because as, as I said the field was more or less exhausted but people continue to fiddle with things which are not so no, no longer that exciting or in, important but our people are still doing that. So he made that comment but why is he here he spent two years in India in at the Aligarh Muslim University during 1930 to 32 or maybe yeah 30, 30, 1930 to 32 he spent two years in India as a professor of mathematics and uh, he's a, he is a very colorful and interesting personality so I will spend some time talking about him even though he is not Indian just because he was on the Indian scene in any case for those two years. Well uh, th this man was a student at uh, the famed Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris one of the great places from which many great mathematicians have uh, emerged. He was working there for his degree around the time he was finishing his degree there was uh, uh, the there was this man called uh, Ross Masood who was uh, the grandson of Syed Ahmed Khan. Syed Ahmed Khan was the founder of the uh, Aligarh Muslim University. It was he started it as it was called Anglo Mohammedan College and later became Aligarh Muslim University. The founder's grandson had been appointed Vice Chancellor of Aligarh University and that happened when he was actually traveling in Europe. He was in Paris when he received the telegram from uh, Ingl India saying that this, he is being appointed that and as soon as he got this he decided that uh, he will recruit people to his university among them he was in Paris and he thought any good university should have a chair in French culture. So he approached a friend of his Sylvain Levy a famous Indologist who lived in Paris approached him to suggest some person to ch take the chair in French culture and Sylvain Levy recommended Andre Vail for that chair. Sylvain Levy knew Andre Vail because Sylvain Levy was giving a course of lectures on Mega Sandesham in uh, in the in uh, Sorbonne. In the, the Sorbonne, he was giving a course of lectures on Mega Sandesham. He was an Indologist. He was very much interested in Sanskrit, and Vail had various interests among them Sanskrit, and so he 
got in started attending his course and was taking a great interest in that course and got to know Sivan Devi very well and apparently impressed Devi greatly. It's not surprising, he is a very colorful, interesting person. And so Devi apparently thought it would be a good, uh, and he, Devi knew that he was interested in going to India and so recommended the name of Vail. There was a short interview of the Vice Chancellor with Vail and on the spot the job was offered and the Vice Chancellor went back saying he would write a formal letter. For several months, we never heard anything from, from the Vice Chancellor and suddenly a letter arrives telling him that he is appointed head of the mathematics department at the university. And Vail remarks, in fact he said that in a personal conversation when in Professor Shetadri was also present when he was visiting Bombay, he said, I do not know at what point of time this Vice Chancellor knew my mathematical credentials. <laughs> that six months later the appointment was served. So this guy packed his bags, 23 years old, he was appointed head of the department with you know, he, he had the right to hire and fire people. Arrived in Aligarh, promptly fired one of his colleagues and sent on another on leave for two years and the third one uh, he kept on and in his autobiography writes, kept him much to my later regret. So that is and then he brought in another uh, he brought in another, Indi uh, another Indian mathematician to his uh, department and that is this man Vijay Raghavan. <coughs> so Vijay Raghavan was a student of Anbhra. He was, uh, he studied in the mathematics honors course of the Madras University. That course has disappeared now. In the old days it is a three year course at the end of which people wrote the same exam as the master's degree people but were awarded given the degree BA honours. But you can collect your MA one year later and the degree certificate says to you is awarded MA by a flux of time. That is exactly what the degree certificate says. It is a funny thing but must be, must be a London University practice imported bias. Anyway, so he joined the honours course but did badly. In fact, there is yeah, difficulty in getting admission because his marks were not so good but Anandra knew him personally and intervened and said this guy is good I will take him and he took him into the honours course. But at the end of the honours course he did not do well, he got what they call recommended BA. And but in the meanwhile he was in correspondence with Hardy and Hardy got him to go to Oxford. Hardy had moved from Cambridge to Oxford so he went to work with Hardy in Oxford. He had published a few papers and so on. And he had come back with, with a degree from Oxford and um, Vail hired them despite the fact that the university rules did not permit somebody who did not have a master's degree in mathematics to join the mathematics department. That kind of rule exists even now. Even now you cannot be, you cannot join as a lecturer in a university if you do not have a master's degree in mathematics. Even if you had a PhD it does not matter. Even now the rule applies. It is a strange kind of thing. Anyway, so but uh, Vail of course had the freedom to wave wave rules, the vice chancellor had given him the freedom and he hired uh, Vijayaragavan despite that. And Vijayaragavan and uh, Vijayaragavan some 6 years senior, maybe more right, I do not know, nine, four, year, 4 years senior, 4 years senior to Vail and he had a great interest in both Tamil and Sanskrit literature and uh, this was very uh, good for uh, Andre Vail who was also interested in these things and uh, they struck up a good friendship. Uh, Vijayaragavan worked in different things, some, some number theory, some analysis, some ability as well and did some interesting work in all those areas. There is uh, in, in mathematics there are some num numbers which are called piso Vijayaragavan numbers <coughs> for example. Well, uh, Vail continued in Aligarh for 2 years and uh, on one, at the end of the second year he had uh, gone to Paris uh, for a vacation when he and where he was really working to build the library for uh, the university and collecting books and so on. But when he came back, he found that uh, <coughs> Vijayaragavan had left. The reason the vice chancellor had tried to persuade Vijayaragavan to take Vail's chair because he was going to sack Vail. And Vijayaragavan, being a very staunch friend, did not like it and he resigned and left and he went to Dhaka. Vail, when he came back, found that. He was going to be sacked. 
and that was the end then he went back to uh, Paris. In fact, there was an attempt by uh, Saras Radhakrishnan, later president of India to get him to get him to Andhra University. Who had, uh, Radhakrishnan was the vice chancellor at uh, Andhra University in Voltaire and he tried to get uh, Vail to go there but Vail was not willing to stay on, he went back. Vail never came back to India though he seems to have been very fond of India in his autobiography he says so, never came back to India but uh, for a long time he came back in 1968 for a week for a uh, maybe a little longer you know, for about a month he spent in India. He had come specifically because of an international meeting in Bombay and what, what they call international colloquium in 1968 he had come to the colloquium. In Bombay the Tata Institute which he was visiting had put him up in the Taj and no doubt uh, we congratulate ourselves on the kind of hospitality we are extending. But Vail got much better hospitality elsewhere. He went to Delhi where he was the guest of the president of India Professor Zakir, uh, Zakir Hussain. Zakir Hussain and he Zakir Hussain is collector Zakir Hussain and he were colleagues at the university in Aligarh. So that is how he knew Aligarh which is coming back after 35 years but managed to kept some touch. So when he goes there he stays at the rush of the bond. And then he goes to Calcutta. What does he do? He stays in the Rajabhavan. The governor of Calcutta at the time, a man named Dharam Veera, was collected at Daligar when Vail was there. So it stuck up a friendship. And then he goes to Madras. In Madras, uh, he did not get that kind of hospitality, but something much, much more interesting and amusing happened. He had apparently met uh, Rajaji somewhere in a Congress meeting or something which he had attended up north. And uh, when he came to Madras he decided to go and see Chennai, he decided to go and see Rajaji, made an appointment, went there and began by saying I do not know if you remember me, then Rajaji stopped him short. Yes, yes I know you are a French professor who was in Aligarh and I find your English is as bad as ever. <laughs> now, Wales English is uh, written English is excellent, his, language, his command of the language is very good but he continued to speak language with a French accent always, yet to, the, to his dying day the French accent could be seen. And that is exactly what uh, Rajaji meant. And Vail is not the kind of person who takes jokes such as expense very nicely, but he apparently admired Rajaji adequately to uh, take this joke and not only that and tell us this is a story which is related to some of us when you are when you are in conversation. So anyway, going back, Vail was as I said is one of the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century. And but unfortunately, I do not think he had great mathematical influence when he was in India in those days. He did, of course, his uh, great work all came after he went back to France and it's influ it has influenced Indian mathematicians of a much later period, but not of that, of that era. Anyway, so, yeah, starting point of Uh, okay, okay. Sorry. So there was, yeah. Okay, there was one paper at least which was, <laughs> and so I stand corrected. Anyway, so, but for example, <coughs> anyway, Vijayaragun uh, had left for Dhaka, as I said, and uh, Vail, uh, yeah, Vail left India. Vijayaragun had gone off to Dhaka, and then later on he came to Chennai. He was appointed director of the Ramanujan Institute. Unfortunately, he died early and did not really function as the director. And 1955, he died. <coughs> now, that's Rajaji. And oh, I thought I had Zakir Hussain also. No, no, I seem to have missed Zakir Hussain. Never, you never mind. Then the next man I'm out there is Sarvadaman Chawla, the first non-South Indian I'm going to talk about now. Chawla. <coughs> Uh, worked, uh, studied in uh, Government College Lahore. He was actually born in England because his father was himself a mathematics professor and was visiting uh, in Cambridge or some such place where he was born. But anyway, he came, he grew up in Lahore, went to Government College Lahore which has also produced other great alumni like uh, Abdus Salam for instance and maybe Hargobin Korana is also uh, Lahore man, I do not know. Anyway, so uh, he studied in Lahore and uh, later <coughs> went to Cambridge and uh, he worked with uh, 
I think sorry Littlewood he worked with Littlewood right he worked with Littlewood and got his degree in fact it's, you know his father had taken him to Cambridge left him there and on the way back he stopped in Paris for tourism unfortunately died on that and uh, so it was the beginning of, of his Cambridge days was not exactly propitious but nevertheless he managed to do a degree quickly and came back to India and uh, he could not uh, then uh, in 1947 during the partition riots he had to migrate to India from Lahore and uh, he was for some time at in Delhi at uh, St. Stephen's College where he met his wife a student married her and then he migrated to the United States he worked most of the time in the United States in fact he never came back to India and he worked in number theory. Yeah, I mean came back in the sense not to spend any length of time okay he, uh, yeah he was uh, he was called an ambassador for number theory he was a full man full of enthusiasm and he did some very nice work he lived in near Princeton and he lived up to a ripe old age but never lost his enthusiasm for mathematics uh, well I do not think uh, Hardy's uh, maxim about uh, Mathematics being finished by 40 is meaningful in the context of people like Chawla who kept on working. So, uh, I well, I think I must uh, rush through some of the other people. Chawla is a uh, number theorist of considerable repute. And in the next man, uh, Madras mathematician is S. Meenak Sundaram, I want to talk about. Meenak Sundaram was also a student of uh, Anand Rao. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I have not tried to find out what it is. Hmm. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, Meenak Sundaram uh, <coughs> began as a student of Anand Rao and he did work uh, in summability and he had a passion for summability right till the end of his life. But he later moved to work with this man here, Reverend Father Rasim, who was uh, a Jesuit priest who had come to India to teach. He was first in St. Joseph's College, Tirichi, and then moved to Lyala College in Chennai and he, he in fact was also one of the people along with uh, Anand Rao and Vaidhinaya Swami who created a very pleasant and nice atmosphere for studying mathematics in, in uh, Chennai. Racine knew some of the uh, great mathematicians of uh, he was in fact a student of one of the great mathematicians of France Eli Katta and uh, he and he was also a close friend of Eli Katta's son Ari Katta who was also a first rate mathematician. And he brought to Madras some of the French outlook on mathematics, which is very different, which was very different from the British way of looking at it. And so it was a new development. And uh, Meenak Sundaram went to work with him, and in fact wrote a thesis on differential equations with Father Racine. Meenak Sundaram's work was quickly recognized as being outstanding. He went and spent. Uh, some two years at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton where he did some very path breaking work, work which 20 years later or 15 years later was used by another Indian named Patodi to prove some very beautiful theorems. So <coughs> Minak Sundaram uh, did after his thesis he had some difficulty getting jobs and so on finally ended up in Andhra University in Voltaire. He was in the applied maths department though his work was not really applied mathematics was not in applied mathematics. Father Racine is a big influence on mathematics students in Chennai. He himself was a good mathematician but the most important thing he did for Indian mathematics was to bring the French outlook on mathematics and areas where French people were working were introduced here. And among others he counts Professor Seshadri as a student. 
he was a student of uh, Racine, profoundly influenced by Racine. Another uh, well known Indian mathematician, M.S. Nathman, was also a student. So, uh, Racine, though he was uh, French, born French, but he, after he came to India, he went back to France only once or something of that kind. He died in Madras eventually in Atlala College. He was a, you know, I met him. I met him only once in the company of uh, Nasiman and you know one tends to think that people in cassettes will be somewhat solemn kind of guys. No, he was not. He, he had a healthy what should I say uh, uh, liking for gossip and that, that, that meeting I had with uh, him with uh, Nasiman I gathered lots of stories about uh, Madras mathematicians <laughs> and he was an important influence. The, <coughs> Well, here is I now go not back. After Harish Chandra, probably Ram, after Ramanujan, Ram, Harish Chandra is probably the greatest mathematician produced by India. He uh, went to college in Allahabad where he taught, took a master's degree in physics. He was a student of the famous physicist K.S. Krishna. His uh, physics paper, one of the physics papers he wrote, he scored 100 on 100. Because this is very common these days, but in those days getting anything past 60 was a, a tough job. He got 100 or 100. Examiner C. V. Raman. So that, and from that examiner to get that kind of mark is, is quite another story. Anyway, and after that uh, he was uh, on Christian suggestions. He went to Institute of Science in Bangalore, where at the time Homi Baba was working. So he worked as a with Homi Baba, wrote a few papers with Homi Baba. And Homi Baba decided that this guy is very bright and should be sent to Dirac, who is one of the biggest figures in modern physics. So Baba sent him to work with Dirac. During that period, he was spent some time with Dirac, but apparently very, there were very few meetings with Dirac, and this guy was uh, more or less working on his own. And then Dirac moved for a year to visit the institute in Princeton, and he took the postdoc along with him. And there, Harishandra met mathematician by name Chevalier, one of the, once again one of the great French mathematicians of the 20th century. And he got interested more and more in mathematics. And he quit physics and switched to mathematics completely under the influence of Chevalier. And he started working in an area which at that time was of great interest to physicists, mathematical area which was great interest to physicists. But for the mathematicians it was considered some kind of backwater, it is not all that important, so called representation theory of Lie groups. In the course of about 10 years after he started on it, Harishchandra brought it center stage to mathematics. It became by the, by the time he finished with it in 1960s, early 60s, it was center stage in mathematics and it was the most considered the most important work in that area in mathematics. So, and he was uh, invited to become a permanent member at the Institute for Advanced Study where Einstein worked as I said. He was a permanent member of the institute. He is uh, a remarkable person in many ways, he was a very intense person and worked very hard all the time and produced some very beautiful work. <coughs> he was, uh, no, I had, I had an opportunity to meet him, I spent a year at the institute when I, he used to be very pleasant doctor, unfortunately we never talked any mathematics though my field is not all that far away from his own field. You know, when you, I, I went there essentially as a postdoc and uh, all these big shots, big names, one is very shy to go, uh, one is nervous to go near them. So, um, uh, certainly not mathematically. I used to talk about mathematics, which is uh, always easier. And he had a distant interest in Indian mathematics. He would make uh, comments, he had, uh, would make very sharp comments and so on. He was... Uh, <coughs> Uh, and before he came to the Institute of Advanced Study, he was in uh, Colombia for a couple of years. And uh, then from when he was in Colombia, he went on leave for a year to Paris, where of course Paris is one of the most important centers for mathematics now and even in those days. And uh, at the end of the year, he felt he should continue for some more time for, to improve his mathematical uh, thing. Uh, so he applied for additional leave and Colombia refused him leave. And he was very upset. And it so happened that Andre Weil, about whom I talked, happened to be there. And he went and consulted Andre Weil what he should do. Andre Weil told him, not only do you write back to them saying that you won't come back to Colombia unless they give you extended leave, ask them for a higher salary. You are a much better mathematician 
<laughs> you don't have to accept the salary they are giving you. Harish Chandra wrote this letter. He was given the leave, given the hike in salary. So, so goes the story. Anyway, so later on, of course, he moved to Princeton, which is the most prestige, prestigious institution, and he continued to do wonderful work. And you know, that year I was there, and there was a visiting mathematician who talked about something called, never mind if you don't know what it is, periodic Lee groups. He made that statement about periodic Lee groups, and Harish Chandra was puzzled when that mathematician made this statement. Because he, he was working on what are known as real Lee groups and this guy was talking about periodic Lee groups. He said something which is not, which simply cannot be true for real Lee groups, but it's all the time true for periodic Lee groups. This guy was very puzzled and then at one point he said, what are you talking about? It's nonsense. This cannot be ever true. And Andre Bell who was in the audience said, oh, Harish always thinks of the pathological case of real numbers. Now, this requires a little mathematical background. The periodic most of us in school learn about the number line and real numbers and so on. But the mathematicians have some other objects known as periodic numbers. There are periodic numbers for every prime p. There are infinitely many collections of periodic numbers, whereas real numbers are just one, which is why Andre Weil said, Harish always thinks of the pathological case of real numbers. But the interesting thing is, two years later, after this incident, Harish Chandra had proved all the major important theorems in period, about periodic Lie groups. The mine was simply fantastic. At, in 66 when I, when I was in Princeton, it was clear that he has no real understanding of what is going on in periodic uh, Lie group theory. Two years later, all the major theorems he had proved. So that is the kind of power as a mathematician that he had. He died at the age of uh, 60. Yes, uh, actually, I, as it happened, I was uh, in Princeton on the day he died. I had, uh, actually gone to a party at his uh, place to celebrate his 60th birthday. But anyway, well, I've already so stepped time. Let me take five minutes, I'll rush through. This is, as you see, C.P. Ramanujan is more a contemporary of mine. All the others I spoke about are much older. He's a contemporary of mine. And he unfortunately died very young. He was an absolutely brilliant uh, mathematician. Uh, but he had some uh, <coughs> problems with schizophrenic and uh, took his own life. But he did some fantastic work. I don't have too much time to talk about him, but he was one of the important mathematicians of the 20th century in Indian, on the Indian scene. Another important mathematician who died young is Vijay Kumar Patodi. He uh, did some interesting, very interesting work on what is known as the Athiya Singer Index Theorem. And uh, he has collaborated with uh, Athiya and bought to the big giants of 20th century mathematics. He was at the Tata Institute. Uh, so Sri Piramardam was also at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research and so was he. And as you see, he died young. And let me, uh, I'll take a few minutes over this last man. I have not even put down his name, Chandrasekharan. K. Chandrasekharan was responsible for building the School of Mathematics at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. He joined the school in 1945 and 1949 and under his uh, leadership, the, it was a fledgling school which essentially only graduate students. He and there were two other professors, uh, uh, the Kosambi and uh, Levy. These are only three people there. And, but the other two people really took no interest in what was happening. But this man started a graduate school to begin with. And within 15 years, the Tata Institute School was established as one of the first rate schools anywhere in the world. That was his achievement. He was a student of Anand Rao again. And after finishing his thesis, he went to the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton and spent a few years there. During which time, Homi Baba had gone there and recruited him. He had gone there to recruit people for his institute, the Tata Institute. And apparently, he got some good reports about uh, Charles Chakran from physicists. I mean, uh, Herman Weil was one of the great physicists of the 20th century. He was uh, in uh, the institute. And Chandrasekhar went as an assistant to Herman Weil. Herman Weil was both a physicist and a mathematician. He was a great mathematician as well as a great physicist. He went to work with him. And Baba brought him back. There are some interesting stories about uh, uh, Chandrasekhar. One day in Princeton, when Baba had gone to hire him, Baba was walking with uh, people like Yukawa and Einstein, taking a walk. And a little behind was Chandrasekhar taking a walk with von Neumann, another great name. And von Neumann asked Chandrasekharan, I am told that uh, this man Baba has offered you a job and are you going to take it? 
Sam Shekhar said, yes, I'm thinking of taking it. And then Baba told him, that guy is as good a physicist as any. Phenomenon told him, that guy is as good a physicist as any. But stand up to him, don't get intimidated. And that was an advice which Sam Shekhar certainly followed. Because at the Tata Institute, when I joined the earlier, it was clear that whatever Baba said, everybody said yes. No one would stand up to Baba. Sam Shekhar was one man who would stand up to Baba. And uh, fought very strongly for the autonomy of the mathematics school there and succeeded in keeping its autonomy. He was a first rate mathematician, but the more important thing he did was to build this school at the Tata Institute. And uh, he is also a very colorful person. I person, will uh, tell you one story about him which I have personal knowledge of. When I was in Princeton, I went to a store, a clothing store with a friend. My another Indian friend, a first rate mathematician with somewhat expensive taste. This was a very expensive shop. I don't know if the, those of you have been in Princeton, in Palmer Square there is a shop with clothing store. I don't know if it exists now. It used to be, I'm talking about 1966. And my friend bought himself a suit, ordered a suit, getting it tailored. I ordered myself a scarf. Well, that's <laughs> and uh, <coughs> then that fellow, the shopkeeper starts start, 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 talking and he asked us, do you people know, did you people know John von Neumann? He said, he said, we have heard the name, we don't know him. Do you know Chanda Shekharan? He said, yes, we have heard, we know, we know him. We also. Those are the only two gentlemen from that institute who knew how to dress. <laughs> this was, uh, so he's a man, had, uh, he was always immaculate dressed. In hottest weather in Bombay, he would always appear in a suit in his, of course, his apartment had, a, had air conditioning. But he had to drive from his uh, flat to the uh, institute in a Fiat car which did not have any air conditioning. And anyway, so, uh, but he always uh, came up, always immaculate in a suit. And uh, he was, you know, he, he made excellent judgments as a mathematician. He was probably not always the very nice as a human being, but as a professional mathematician, he held the best possible standards. He recognized talent, even if he was not particularly like the person involved, he recognized talent and reacted to it correctly. It's a remarkable way the whole place developed. And he managed to get all kinds of out outstanding mathematicians to come to Bombay to lecture to the students whom he had chosen. People like Laurent Schwartz, who was one, 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 one of the big figures. He came and spent three months in Tata Institute teaching graduate students. And he himself could, could, there was no one to talk to except graduate students. And there, one of his audience was his here, Seshadri, and uh, his close friend, Narsaman, and both of them benefited greatly by Schwartz. And there are many other lectures of that kind. And he, the point is that he was, his PR work was so good that he could get all kinds of top class mathematicians to visit Bombay only to teach graduate students. Well, that was uh, Chandrasekhar, and uh, the Indian mathematical community was a great deal to him. And with, on that note, I think I'll end this lecture. Thank you for your attention. interaction between uh, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research and French mathematicians. And once again, it was Tan who was responsible for building up that relationship. And as I said, you know, the, uh, it was mainly, uh, I said, he brought many outstanding mathematicians abroad to come and lecture to the graduate students. Most of them were French. There were also some German, in fact, one of the grades of uh, uh, German mathematics, of, Indi uh, of uh, 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 one of the great men of mathematics of the 20th century, Carl Ludwig Siegel, has come to Bombay three or four times. In fact, I have sat through one of his lecture courses, but didn't, wasn't following anything. But the audience had fall, fallen down to four, and there's no way I could drop out. Good. With that, let me. Yes.
Varadhan. Ah, okay. Who won the Nobel Prize? Uh, right, right, right. Recently. I mean, uh, uh, let let me put it like this. Uh, there was some, of course, you know, the earlier generation. Uh, Varadhan belongs to my generation. In that generation, there are a number of people who migrated to the United States, and some of them did very well. Some half a dozen of them performed very well. And before before Varadhan, there was this uh, Abhyankar, who was also a first grade mathematician. Harishchandra, of course, also also a migrant. And all, the, but barring that half a dozen people, the others they were reasonable. But for example, I don't think uh, the Tata Institute certainly more than matched the performance of anybody other than these three or four people. And actually matched more than matched in other cases and probably matched these people. And uh, but you know what is happen, happening now is more interesting. The second generation people of Indian origin are growing at or second or third generation now are doing a, a tremendous uh, job. And some of them are uh, right at the top now. Uh, this is guy Manjul Bhargava who has been doing wonderful work all along and so on. So, uh, in, in between generation of course there are people like uh, Ramurthy who is here who have done us proud but as I said it is uh, the, the current generation current crop of uh, youngsters who come up seem to be going even further up. Okay, we will close this now. Thank you.